Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all the honorable guests, dignitaries, dear fellows, with great joy and immense exultation. I, Zuhar Rehan from Department of Software Engineering, Lahore Gazing University, warmly welcome you all to the fifth national conference on computer science and information technologies organized by Department of Software Engineering. Nothing can be started without the remembrance of Allah Almighty, who created this whole universe. So, I would like to call Hafiz Ilfanullah from Islamic Studies Department to revise few verses of Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يدلو يَتْلُو عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ Everything in the heavens and in the earth glorifies Allah, the real king, the most pure of all shortcomings and imperfections, the Lord of honor, the Almighty, the most wise. He is the one who sent a glorious messenger, blessing and peace be upon him amongst the illiterate people from amongst themselves, who recites to them his revelations and cleanness and purifies them outwardly and inwardly and teaches and teaches them the book and wisdom. Indeed, they were in open error before his most welcome arrival. And he has sent the messenger for purification and education amongst others of them also who have not yet joined these people. And he is almighty, most wise. This arrival of the holy messenger is Allah's bounty, which he grants home who likes. And Allah is most bountiful. صدق الله Proceeding further, let's have a look on the documentary of LG.
Lahore Garrison University is a welfare project of Pakistan Army and one of the largest private universities of Pakistan, ranked among the top educational institutions of the country. Located in the metropolitan city of Lahore, LGU is an important milestone in the history of higher education in Pakistan. It has fast grown from purely academic higher education institute to a research university and is developing fast as an entrepreneurial university. The genesis of the university goes back to 1984 when two postgraduate colleges were amalgamated and then were awarded the charter by the government of Punjab in 2014. LGU is accredited with the Higher Education Commission and National Business Education Accreditation Council. The university has four main faculties, divided into 14 departments, and offers about 50 undergraduate and postgraduate programs. Moreover, seven Korean students have been enrolled in the Urdu language certificate and diploma courses. Our institution's aim is to develop as a leading university in teaching research, innovation, and commercialization to achieve international academic excellence. At LGU, we have aligned our long-term objectives as self-sustenance, that is, raising resources to the tune of 1 billion rupees in few years, creation of research, culture, and environment by establishing industry academia linkage mechanisms, achieving national ranking among the top 20 and international top 500 universities, and development of quality infrastructure for transformation into a smart campus. In pursuance of these objectives, some of the progress made is manifested in the increase of student population from 1,700 to 7,000 plus. Similarly, the faculty has increased reasonably in the last seven years to 300 plus, including more than 77 PhDs, which has increased eight times from nine PhDs at the onset. In pursuit of a secure financial future, LGU's revenue has quadrupled in the recent years. The infrastructure of Lahore Garrison University has increased from 90,000 square feet to 350,000 square feet, presently including a mosque, about 120 state-of-the-art classrooms, fully equipped auditoriums with cutting-edge multimedia, a functional Australian cricket pitch, a multi-story parking, a furnished cafeteria for 600 students, a refreshment lounge for faculty, and a world-class broadcasting studio with its commercial license in process. In addition, the university is now producing renewable energy with the installation of 500 kilowatt solar system. LGU has set up a dedicated research block for facilitation of its researchers, providing access to 50,000 plus e-books and 100 MB dedicated internet. We have successfully awarded degrees to more than 2,700 students at Lahore Garrison University's three convocations. LGU stands tall in establishing Asia's first digital forensic research and service center, which was inaugurated by Chief Justice of Pakistan. Coming to the research journals, LGU has achieved an unprecedented benchmark of publishing seven research journals and a campus magazine in the last year. The number of research entries have successfully gone up from just 12 to over 500 and counting. Our biggest achievement is the approval of Office of Research, Innovation and Commercialization. From 2017 till date, LGU has hosted several international and national conferences, achieving noteworthy success. We have signed long-term MOUs with national and international organizations and foundations, including but not limited to CXO Global Forum, eCADME Contract, Connectors Institute of International Skills, Pearson BTEC Qualification, among others. The university is in the process of seeking agreement terms with high-ranking educational institutions in Germany, UK, Finland, Australia, and United States of America. LGU has been declared as the best university by the virtue of highest entries to Hull Foundation's Business Idea International Competition, through which three of our students led teams qualified for regional finals in Melbourne and Toronto. We secured the first position out of 86 universities and 180 teams competing at NERC, Pakistan's largest robotic competition. In NERC 2019, LGU secured three positions in all competing categories and bagged first position in modular category. LGU CS student was selected as one of the six finalists out of 7,000 plus 
who went on to secure the second position in Huawei regional finals held in China. LGU consists of 18 plus clubs and societies functioning under Student Affairs and Counseling Department. <laughs> LGU's full-scale sports complex caters to more than 32 sports because we believe that our students should have substantial facilities to develop their health simultaneously with their academics. Lately, our national ranking in athletics has dramatically risen. LGU has been ranked in top 10 national teams across the board by securing numerous awards and medals in various championships. Some of these competitions include HEC InterVarsity Tug of War Championship, HEC InterVarsity Judo Men and Women Competition, and thus won two gold, six silver, and 12 bronze medals. On the basis of highest levels of media professionalism, LGU became the official media partner for HEC TV to host live transmissions on a weekly basis and receive media equipment worth Rs 2 million from HEC. As a matter of great honor and pride, LGU has been shortlisted at the provincial level for the commencement of live transmission of Microsoft Imagine Cub 2019 and 2020 and stood first in broadcasting the live transmission at a national level. Assalamu alaikum everyone, my name is Duran Nayab and we are live from Lahore Garrison University. Our latest project, Education for Everyone, will enable students from all backgrounds in the country to attain quality higher education at zero cost. Lahore Garrison University is striving for excellence and looks forward to empowering youth for the better future of the nation. Further to the conference, let me tell you the objective of this conference, which is to bring together leading academic scientists, researchers, industry persons, and research scholars to exchange and contribute their knowledge, experiences, and research, uh, research outcomes in all phases of computer science and information technology. This conference will feature traditional paper presentations by prominent speakers who will focus on state of art technologies. So let's begin our session by inviting our first keynote speaker, Dr. Yasser Awan. Dr. Yasser Awan is a director of Mindstone Studio. He is a graduate of computer science from the National University of Computer and Emerging Sciences. He is a serial entrepreneur who has built products for millions of users in his career spanning over 15 plus years. Before joining NIC Lahore, he routinely advised startups from various verticals on product perception, business strategy, and raising investments. Awan is a driven and passionate individual with a single-minded intention to make the entrepreneurial sector of Pakistan strive. He has over 15, 15 years of game development experience and hits in the bag, including critically acclaimed PC titles like Cricket Revolution and the IC 2011 official World Cup cricket game, Cricket Power. Amlabs has a purpose-built space to house and groom the best game development talent in Pakistan via incubation, game jams, internships, and a nationwide fellowship programs. So the topic of his discussion is $150 billion opportunity. Please give a warm welcome to Sir Yasser Awan. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Yes, sir. Um, Honorable Chief Guest Fawad uh, Chaudhary Sahib, Janab, Major General Shahzad Sikandar Sahib, the organizers, uh, respected faculty members, and students, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be a keynote speaker at this prestigious conference, and it's my actually it's my second time uh, in this conference. Uh, I've been here a couple of years back as well, 
and I thoroughly enjoy it uh, whenever I'm here. Or whenever I'm at LGU, I really love the entrepreneurial spirit uh, of this university. Uh, so a couple of years back, I came in into this conference and talked about effective commercialization of research. And I'm glad to uh, say that tomorrow I'm going to be conducting a workshop in this conference uh, on, on that particular topic where we, we are going to work on a methodology on how to how to do effective commercializable research. Um, but coming back to the keynote uh, keynote address. So today uh, uh, I'm going to talk about $150 billion opportunity. And it's an opportunity that we have put on back burner for long enough. Um, essentially, it's an, an industry that we have turned a blind eye towards for the past two decades. Uh, and today we're going to talk about it, but before we do, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. Um, as you guys already know, I'm Yasser Awan. Um, I'm director of labs at Mindstorm Studios. And uh, before coming to Mindstorm Studios, uh, I've worked in the industry for more than 15 years. Um, and I've worked in different sectors, including 10 years in media, advertisement and publishing. Uh, a few years in development sector uh, as well. And, and I've built products for more than 70 million users. And those products range from uh, deep tech or, uh, or high tech products, uh, software products, hardware products. Um, before coming to Mindstorm Studios, I worked in NIC Lahore, um, which is based out of LUMS. And over there, I advised more than 100 startups uh, on business strategy and helped about a dozen of them in raising investment. Um, so, so that's that's pretty much uh, about me. Just a few corrections in the announcement. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I don't have a PhD. Uh, so that's one. And secondly, uh, some of the things mentioned in, in the introduction, let me just quickly correct those. Uh, I haven't been in gaming industry for 15 years. I have relative, I'm relatively new to this industry. I've been around for one and a half years. Uh, and uh, some of the games that mentioned were mentioned in the introduction, we're going to talk about those. Uh, that's some awesome work that Mindstorm Studios that I currently work for is doing. So let's let's quickly move, move towards the topic. So, so the $150 billion industry that we're going to talk about is the game development industry. And just to put things in perspective, uh, that how big that industry is, that this industry is bigger than the movies and music industry combined. Um, the, the US uh, uh, movie, movie industry is about $50 billion. The music industry is about $20 billion. This industry, the global game development industry is about $150 billion, which is much bigger than actually, actually bigger than twice of these industries combined. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, the agenda today is what this industry is, what is Pakistan been doing in this in the particular industry, what are the opportunities and uh, what are the way forwards. Uh, so just to give you again some perspective on how big this industry is. So <clears throat> essentially this, uh, on, on, on the presentation, you'll be seeing uh, a screenshot of a game called Fortnite, which is and the annual revenue last year for Fortnite was $5.1 billion. That's one game. And that's about 2.5 times the revenue of entire Pakistani IT industry. Uh, so that's how big um, this industry is. Um, and, and, and there are two aspects of this industry. Uh, one is the game development or building games. And the other one is the esports industry. Uh, we're going to touch upon the e sports industry a little bit, but primarily we're going to be uh, talking about, um, I'm going to be talking about the game development industry. So, uh, so e-sports industry itself is quite a big industry. And um, there's a, just to give you a perspective on that, there's a clan called FaZe Clan, which is primarily uh, uh, a, a team that plays different e-sports or different uh, computer games. Um, and that team is worth about $300 million. Uh, so $300 million worth for people who just play games. Uh, and we're not just talking, we're not talking about building games right now. 
So, so that's kind of like the big industry. So, so gaming industry has been around uh, for, for about 50 years and started off with the likes of Atari building uh, arcade games and, and from there onwards, it flourished into uh, consoles and PCs and all those. Um, uh, the, 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 there has been a rise of esports in uh, uh, industry uh, for the past at least 20 years. And in the recent past, after the advent of iPhone uh, in 2007, um, there has been a huge, huge spike in the mobile game development industry. Um, and that's something we're going to talk about as well. Uh, so, but one of the prime reason for, for bringing this talk to this esteemed conference is uh, is the role that Pakistan can play in, in becoming a global player in the game development industry and the huge potential of technology as well as for foreign reserve that we can bring in. And one of the ways to look at it is to look at the recent successes in, in, in this region, uh, where we look at, let's say, Turkey, and we see that there have been unicorn exits in that uh, in Turkey, uh, Peak Games was acquired by Zynga uh, for 1.8 billion dollars, uh, and that kind of like sparked uh, a revolution uh, in in kind of like uh, Turkish uh, game development space. Um, and gaming essentially, and the reason I'm, I'm mentioning Turkey is because also we can draw a lot of parallels between Turkey and Pakistan. So Turkey is uh, is a pop has a population of about 80 million people and uh, out of those 50 million people are gamers uh, and which is a phenomenal number and one of the important things here is that most of the bulk of that 80 million people are young population and pakistan is in a similar kind of space where about 60 percent 60 70 percent of our population is young uh, and the young population looks to, at the world in a very different way uh, and and I think that's that's also an opportunity for us to kind of like walk on similar path as Turkey and 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 be able to produce the same kind of success because uh, <clears throat> because <coughs> excuse me so so similar kind of success and 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 just to talk a little bit about the ecosystem before we get into things so. One of the things that you might ask yourself is who plays who plays these games. Uh, so the answer now is pretty much everybody. Um, the, the 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 advent of mobile games, uh, kind of like and then genres like hyper casual games, which are super simple games, have expanded the horizon of gaming. Uh, anybody from a four year old to an eighty year old plays games. Uh, the the pop, the gender split in in gamers is about in, in a lot of areas about 56% males and 40, 44% females. So there are a lot of women playing games as well. It's not just a men dominated uh, vertical anymore. So, and, and the platforms generally, there, there are three main platforms uh, on game development. Um, we have mobile gaming, we have PC gaming, and we have console gaming. And we're going to look at from the market perspective, uh, we're going to take a deeper dive into mobile gaming space for a bit and see how big of an opportunity it is. Um, so let's for a second imagine a week in the world of mobile gaming. Uh, so in one week, about 1 billion downloads are done when it comes to games. Uh, and, and people spend about 1.7 billion US dollars uh, uh in terms of uh, in games in different aspects and about five billion hours are spent playing games uh, and that's just a week uh in mobile gaming and mobile gaming itself is all, uh, well on, on its way to becoming uh uh hundreds of billions of dollars worth of industry uh, here's a quick overview of different genres and we're not going to take a deeper dive into it because that's kind of like an entire discussion. Uh, but there are all sorts of games that exist. There are hyper casual games, there are simulation games, there are action games, uh, there are puzzle games, uh, there, are, there are shooting games, there are racing games, there are sports games, role-playing games and all sorts of games. But, but uh, right now, 
uh, if you look at in terms of downloads, hyper casual games is the biggest segment uh, when it comes to people downloading and playing games. And the reason is, as I said, hyper casual games are super simple games. So, <clears throat> so what's the missed opportunity here? Uh, so in the past two decades, we have seen the rise of IT industry in Pakistan, uh, but but gaming in general has been has been around in that industry. There have been studios, there have been work, there, there was there is work being done, but primarily it hasn't been comparable to the overall growth of the industry. Uh, and one of the reasons is that people consider generally consider gaming a waste of time, whereas we now see clearly how big of an industry and opportunity it is. There aren't enough educational programs uh, when it comes to teaching people how to build games and there aren't enough exposure opportunities as well. And these are some of the key areas that we have been focusing on too. And I'll talk about it uh, in a little bit. Uh, so right now in Pakistan, the, we have about 100 plus game development studios uh with biggest ones being mindstorm studios and involving games and we are plays and Jedi teams and tin tashes the other um and these are the big studios and but there are more than 100 studios in the country uh the industry has been thriving lately uh and you see instances like the likes of turbo labs raising investment or console ads which is a um ad network for games raising money they're Almost all the big studios in the country are, are, are basically expanding into new and bigger offices, uh, which shows that the industry is flourishing. There is, there is foreign investment available and there, there are publishing deals available. Almost everybody in the country is working with international publishers uh, and, and other than the people who, who self-publish. So the industry is now thriving. There is a lot of opportunity in terms of both, uh, both jobs as well as entrepreneurship. So, so, and there are some interesting things that I would like to share with you guys. So, uh, yes, we aren't prominent when it comes to the global landscape of game development because we're very small, but that does not mean that we haven't been doing some, some great work. So just to give you the perspective, the biggest hyper casual uh, publisher in the world, their top game is built by a Pakistani developer, uh, which is Nail Salon. Uh, one of the studios in Pakistan called Hazel Studios, Hazel Mobile is among the top top 10 uh, publishers in terms of downloads in India, uh, which is a huge market, which is in terms of download the biggest market right now in the world. Um, same goes for Mindstorm Studios. Um, uh, Mindstorm Studios is among the most successful hyper casual game developer for App Lovin, which is um, among the biggest ad networks in the world. Uh, and we're going to talk about it about that as well. So, so just to get to the story of Mindstorm Studios, we were founded in 2006, and we started off with uh, PC games like it was mentioned the reduction. Uh, we started off with Cricket Revolution, which was a PC game. And in 2006, there wasn't any infrastructure available. There wasn't any facilities available. But uh, the founding team kind of like. Um, set their eyes on this target that they want to build a great PC game. And that PC game eventually ended up being the official World Cup game for uh, ICC World Cup, uh, which was a big achievement. And But uh, the journey of Mindstorm Studios has been a, a journey of evolution and rediscovery, where we have continuously rediscovered ourselves. And so we have done PC games, we have done mid-core games, casual games, and, and now hyper-casual games. So we've been around the block, we have been uh, we are one of we are one of the few studios in Pakistan who uh, are primarily only product based studios, and uh, and we have been building games uh, uh, instead of uh, instead of software development. So so one of the so we are the biggest the most successful uh, studio when it comes to hyper casual games. In the last one and a half year, we have published six games with world biggest hyper casual studio. Uh, 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 higher schedule publisher, which is Line Studios. So, so these include Hospitaling, Flickpool, uh, Idle Makeover, Super Sloan, Futspa, Parkov. These are the games that have millions of downloads. They have been um, picked up by the top publishers in the uh, in the world. So, yes, there have been instances of great 
success, inspirational success by different studios in Pakistan. And now is the time to capitalize on that. And when it comes to Mindstorm Studios, for us, the next step was how can we take this to the next step? How can we share this learning to others so that they can go out there and produce similar kind of success? And hence, Mindstorm Labs was born. Uh, where our mantra is to create, collaborate, and win. So, so by creating products, by teaching people how to create great games um, through collaborations and eventually creating creating wins for the industry. Uh, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mindstorm Labs now. Uh, so, so we are essentially catalyzing game development across a population of 20 million uh, people, uh, and we want to build the next hyper casual games powerhouse. Uh, right now, we have been around for one and a half year, and our outreach is expanded around 98 cities and 129 universities. And I'm going to talk a little bit about as well in terms of what kind of programs we're running for these universities. Because uh, <clears throat> I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the gaps that we see, we're trying to address those gaps uh, because there aren't enough exposure opportunities, there aren't enough uh, educational uh, uh, routes available when it comes to game development. So we are essentially a purpose of space, uh, but we run country's biggest online and remote programs as well. Uh, and we, we accomplish this through incubation, game jams, internship programs, and fellowship programs. So, <clears throat> so our main programs obviously include incubation, which is primarily for professionals and indie, indie studios. So we incubate them and we teach them how to build uh, great games by sharing our learning uh, from our success. We also have uh, an internship program, which is which is country's most sought after uh, internship program. The acceptance rate for this program is about 0.5%, um, and thousands of people apply for this program. Uh, we also run the biggest fellowship program uh, uh, in the country, and the purpose of the fellowship program is again I'll I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in a bit, but it's also about creating pathways for young learners. To come explore game development, uh, get exposure, network in the industry, and 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 learn from the best. So, <clears throat> and and we also do a lot of game jams as well. So, <clears throat> so why do we do this? As I mentioned, we saw some gaps in the industry and and the ecosystem that we're trying to address. So, the, our primary focus is to create pathways for young learners to explore their passion, uh, and also show students or give students a flavor of professional work. Uh, and one of the key purpose, because if we want to put Pakistan on the map of global game development industry, uh, and that's kind of like our single minded focus, we need to work very closely with academia. So nothing is possible without the right interventions by both industry and academia. And, and by working together, we can create opportunities uh, for young young learners and and bring by doing that we also bring fresh perspective to the industry because if they are young minds joining the industry by either uh, getting job doing jobs or or launching their own indie studios uh, they'll bring in fresh perspective they'll bring in fresh thought uh, to the process and that will help us kind of like put Pakistan on the map of global development and uh, so our our mantra is to kind of like really invest in young people and that is kind of like we geek out a lot about this equation that we came up with which is which is which is young is equal to 10 times the raw talent and and passion to the power x and and summation of all fresh perspectives so so uh, so far we have we have we have had about 2000 applicants in our programs fellowship programs and we have trained about 1000 uh, students and we also have the biggest discord community online for game development which has about 2000 uh, members already <clears throat> so we have also done uh, country's biggest game jams uh, which have been uh, attended by hundreds of participants and uh, we have built a lot of games and overall the prize pool for for these game jams have been about 4 million uh, so we have two game jams. One is the rookie game jam, which is part of our summer program. And the other one is a winter game jam, which is part of our winter program. So, <clears throat> so uh, we have talked about the outcomes already in terms of what do, what do people get? 
uh, young young learners get when they attend these programs. But I want to quickly touch upon uh, why we started these programs. There, I, I talked about the overall vision, but we started off with internship program where we wanted to uh, induct about eight students uh, and and train them on game development and uh, different aspects of game development. Um, but we got about 700 applications for the first time now. So we started talking to these kids and we started interviewing them and, and we realized there were a few things that echoed across all those conversations. And those things were all these kids thought they were, they were the only ones, only crazy ones who were thinking about game development and there were, weren't any other people around who had similar interests than in them. Um, they were also kind of like being told continuously this is something that that you can't build a career in and this is something that's not of much use when it comes to um, um, learning a particular skill. They've also been kind of like told by their own peers that I don't want to work with you because you'll do, you'll build a game as a project and I don't want to build a game as a project. So that kind of like sort of like focused us towards first building a community that all these people can come together and learn game development as well as also give these people perspective in terms of that they are successful careers, uh, both in terms of jobs and entrepreneurship in the industry. And, and we need to do this kind of like to, to put Pakistan on the map of global game development. Uh, so, so this is us so far and what's next is, is something really important uh, for all of us to think about. And that is for academia and industry to sit together and talk about what is it that we need to do to, to tap into this opportunity of 150 uh, billion dollars and and so what we need to do is we need to collaborate more we need to come up with more granular programs so right now the programs that we run are uh, our major one of the major programs is our summer program which is a two months program and we train people for a month and then they build game for a month which is essentially a game jam uh, so we need to come up with more granular programs and we've been working on a design in terms of how do we make interventions uh, and work with, with, with academia to kind of like uh, transfer these programs in terms of student chapters and student ambassadors to kind of like conduct activities inside universities that will give people more exposure. We also need to come up with curriculum interventions. The great thing is there are some universities out there who are already thinking about, uh, who are already offering game development uh, or game building courses or are thinking about offering an entire degree programs around this. Uh, we need to also, one of the pain points uh, in, in creative domains is that we need, we need collision of more ideas. We need to, <clears throat> we need to do this cross pollination where in, in academia as well, students need to talk to each other. Students from different disciplines need to talk to each other. Uh, that conversation isn't happening. And one of the key goals for us to like encourage those conversations through different events, through different opportunities, and, and, and to kind of like create a well-rounded experience for all these students so that they don't just have the technical skill, but also have the creative skill to go out there and, and shine and put Pakistan on the map of uh, global game development industry. Uh, so thank you so much uh, uh, for being a patient audience. That's it from me. If any of you have any question, you can raise your hand. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening speech. Now, I would like to give a brief introduction to our next speaker, Professor Dr. Brigadier Shreve Ahmed Khan, Tamdhari Piyas Military, retired. He received his PhD from Georgia Institute of Technology, USA in 1995. While in the US, he got extensive experience of working in several top notch technology companies like Scientific Atlanta, PictureTel, and Cisco System. He is also a co founder and chancellor of CASE and CEO of CARE. He has been awarded with numerous honors and awards. These include Tambay Imtiaz Pakistan. NASP Best uh, Teacher Award, 
AGC Best Researcher Award, and NCR National Excellence Award in Engineering Education. He has five US patents in his credit. He has contributed 330 plus international publications and a world-class textbook on digital design of signal processing system published by John Willey and Sons. He is currently serving as a member and focal person of Prime Minister Task Force and technology-driven knowledge economy, science and technology, and IT and telecommunication, deputy chairman of NCEAC under HEC, board member of Shifa International Hospital, and he served as a chairman of Pakistan Software Houses Association for year 2014 till 2015. So please welcome Professor Dr. Brigadier Shoaib Ahmed with a big round of applause. Assalamu alaikum ji, thank you very much. Uh, so, so, this is what I thought I should talk about the role of innovation in technology driven knowledge economy. And uh, really, the objective is uh, uh, to teach our students. Uh, who are taking their uh, even term projects and final year projects and their thesis, uh, this art of innovation and, and especially uh, the enthusiastic IT professionals uh, that if they intend to start a startup, that uh, innovation is very central to startups. And then also universities and teachers that how can they uh, make students to learn the skills of innovation. Uh, so with these three objectives, um, it is important uh, to basically define what innovation is. And I am sure that we all have um, uh, a feeling, uh, uh, primarily we understand, um, uh, even without any definition, that innovation is doing something new, something novel. Uh, but there are other aspects of innovation as well that uh, innovation is only meaningful uh, if you are solving a meaningful problem and creating value out of that. Uh, so it's just a novel solution will not suffice. Uh, it has to be a problem solving uh, innovation uh, that creates value for people. Uh, it, it's like, uh, I think uh, uh, Ilama Iqbal you know, uh, has really appreciated people who could innovate. In his poetry said, Jo alam e ijad mein hai sahib e ijad Har daur mein karta hai tawafuz kadmana Taklis se nakara na kar apni khudi ko Kar iski hifazat ke bohar hai yagana At that time he said, anybody who can invent new things Whole world will be after him So with this, uh, uh, I thought to have uh, the following uh, As uh, uh, the outline of my talk uh, Where I shall be talking about the post-COVID uh, scenario and uh, what is knowledge economy, uh, what is Pakistan standing, uh, how should we innovate your case study, uh, and then we finally we should conclude. And we have all seen the impact of uh, uh, coronavirus on world economy. All major economies have plunged deeps, many businesses have wiped out, uh, but then there are businesses who are gaining actually in COVID. And interestingly, Pakistan IT industry is doubled, you know. So that is very encouraging part of uh, uh, how people can actually uh, react and reorientate and innovate. Uh, and, and especially, so you people are very important uh, because if every two years we, we double this number, uh, then we can hit the Moore's law uh, and that will be very, very beneficial for Pakistan. So the knowledge economy uh, is just knowledge of people uh, uh, helping a country uh, to build its economy is called knowledge economy. And knowledge can directly be trans, uh, uh, transported or the knowledge can get into products in agriculture, in industry, uh, and can make uh, a country you know, uh, earn foreign remittances. And, and so, so the knowledge economy is very critical and human resource is central uh, to knowledge economy. 
This is uh, another slide which tells us that an agri -work worker working uh, 12 months in a year could hardly make 600 US dollars, whereas a knowledge worker can make 20,000 US dollar. Uh, so knowledge economy is, uh, is very key to progress and prosperity of countries. But unfortunately, Pakistan is very poor standing. And uh, if we compare it with India, uh, and that's what we usually do, uh, only two companies in India makes more money than the entire export of Pakistan. This is Infosys and Tata. And uh, similarly, uh, their IT and ITS export is about $136 billion and we have only $2 billion. Uh, so just in last four months, you know, there are 11 unicorns in India and there are a total of 48 unicorns. They are third in the world. And in Pakistan, we have none. If you try to find out that how many unicorns we have, uh, you only hit these type of uh, news that uh, we'll have a... Uh, Pakistan witness a uh, unicorn. So this has not happened yet. Uh, so that's make it more critical for us at least to have few unicorns uh, in, in coming years. So uh, obviously um, there are reasons and one reason is our capacity for innovation that we are ranked 96th in the world uh, in our capacity to innovation. Uh, and our quality of education, we are very poorly ranked. And in our quality of math and science education, we are poorly ranked. And you look at the countries, we have not even heard of the names uh, where we share this, <laughs> this ranking. So, um, um, so, so perhaps the fourth reason is that we have not invested in building our digital capacity. Uh, the world digital competitive ranking, if you look at Pakistan, you will not even find Pakistan in this ranking, and that is also very disappointing. And even if, if you look deeper and search, and you will find Pakistan very low in the bottom, that one thing is that we are in the bottom, the second is we are not even accelerating. And whereas people believe uh, that uh, connectivity is key to uh, progress and prosperity of a country, and they even relate it to Roti, Kapra, Makan, and Internet, and I have been like visiting and finding out every country on the globe is focusing on making their country digital. May it be Malaysia as a digital Indonesia as the digital paradise. Bangla, uh, Thailand said they'll be uh, go digital with a big bang in 2020 when Bangladesh is uh, striding uh, hard and fast uh, to be digital. Uh, so Sri Lanka has a complete strategy as a nation uh, for going digital, uh, India, in spite of committing all, all the atrocities, they're way ahead in their uh, strive to go digital. So is Dubai wants to be 10 times ahead of everybody uh, uh, once it comes to innovation. And we have been trying, at least uh, we have slogans of digital Pakistan, but not much has realized uh, till today. Uh, and we... On the other hand, everybody is spending more and more money on research and development and innovation, and we are cutting down our on R and D expenses. Uh, so this reminds me of John Elia, who says, "Main bhi bahut ajeeb hoon, itna ajeeb hoon ke pas khud ko tabah kar liya aur milal bhi nahi." So it's bleak, but uh, but still there is a potential for Pakistan to exploit, and that is something which excites me a lot. Uh, that we have potential. Uh, I have been uh, going with the Pakistani delegation to make our kids compete on an international arena. And I meet with kids from other countries. These are kids from Hong Kong. Right from grade two and three, uh, their schools start teaching them how to innovate. So they made me sit on this chair and the chair will tell me if my posture is right or not. Okay? And again, I met them after two years and a, a bit grown up kids. And now they come up with a with a Madison box for uh, their grandfathers or grandparents, and it will remind grandparents that they have to take their medicines. And we took our kids; uh, these are the kids from nurse. Uh, their first exposure to such a forum, and uh, and after training, like they won the gold award. So that basically motivates me that if we teach our kids how to innovate and how to present uh, their innovation, they can do wonders for Pakistan. 
So, so we have perhaps all the ingredients uh, that to be globally competitive. We have large young population, like people who are attending this conference, um, affordable connectivity, though internet is bad, but at least it is not costly. And then the number of educational institutions, now, so and and many problems. No matter where you stand, you will find a problem that is to be solved. Uh, so and then obviously a lot has to be on the government. Like if they put us on the right track, like few years back, uh, HEC started focusing on publication, and we have taken over uh, even India uh, on per capita uh, publication, where they are meaningless. Uh, maybe most of these are meaningless publication, but at least we know uh, how to write papers. So similarly, now we need to teach our our kids have to innovate uh, because the turnaround time of, of a company uh, to go from zero to uh, a unicorn, which is a billion dollar valuation company is 4.4 years. Means we can turn around Pakistan in five to 10 years time uh, if our focus is right. And I find you know, a lot of talent in our kids and especially our students in their final year projects and, and our startups they just do wonders and I have been tracking them right from 2010. Every time they go, they win uh, the gold award or the silver award in the region. This is 2014, two gold in 15, then again, even uh, three goals uh, next year. Uh, and even in Bangladesh, uh, we have the best startup company. Uh, and then in China, uh, we have several awards or seven awards. So uh, I have been working with some outstanding kids like he is the CTO of Kareem. He was our first employee once I hired him and I found him just an amazing person. Um, and then he went ahead uh, with Mudassar and created what uh, Kareem is today. And then there are people like Rehan Jalil. He started a company, uh, sold it for $280 million. Amir Khan uh, started and sold for $610 million. Mudassar. Uh, about three point something billion dollars. Uh, so this is uh, uh, trucking as an valuation of 1.4 billion dollar. Uh, Zia Chishti's AI company, I think, have an office in Islamabad and Lahore. Uh, already had a billion dollar valuation. Aisha Razi sold his company for 10 billion dollars. But the issue is they don't register their companies in Pakistan, and and the the companies are registered in. Uh, uh, in other countries and so they reap the benefit of uh, our talented people uh, but that's okay for now but uh, our government needs to come and uh, basically create a uh, good environment for people to do business so that uh, our creative minds can basically can directly benefit our country so um, uh, what are the technologies uh, that we should focus for innovation and I've been part of the Prime Minister Task Force uh, on Knowledge Economy, and we have been pondering then a task force on uh, IT and telecommunication and science and technology, learning about where the world is focusing and a lot of AI, 5G, connectivity, uh, Industry 4.0, and then listing the technologies where we should focus and then uh, developing uh, programs and projects in these areas. Uh, so uh, once we decide that we need to innovate. We've got to focus on AI. We've got to focus on Industry 4.0, cybersecurity, which are these are the related. These are the things which are related to computer science, and then the other areas, obviously, as well. And Industry 4.0 means that it's a fourth industrial revolution. It's a cyber physical systems where machines talk to machines. Though we are way, way behind, you know, rest of the world. Uh, but still, in whatever capacity we have as a, as a student, professor, entrepreneurs, we shall try uh, to help our industry to get to Industry 4.0, uh, which also means that uh, in, in our schools, and uh, we need to focus on IoTs, Internet of Things, uh, and connecting machines on AI, on IoTs, and then focusing on artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence just simply means that um, you let an algorithm think like a human, mimic like a human, and act like a human. And AI is not itself a product. AI should be uh, part of anything you do um, as a business, as education, as project. So it is about rethinking. So rethinking finance, rethinking education, 
rethinking supply chain management, rethinking healthcare. So you got to rethink in terms of AI and device um, algorithms that are uh, intelligent algorithms. So, and then um, fourth is the blockchain. And again, we hardly find any expertise in, in blockchain in our academia, uh, but blockchain is going to be a technology of future uh, and it's going to change our world. And, and especially uh, blockchain application, not only in cryptocurrency, but in smart cities. So we have formulated a national strategy, have presented it to the prime minister and targeting even 1% of the AI market, which is $15.7 trillion, um, uh, we can just make around $157 billion for Pakistan. So it's, it's important. And these are the number of projects that uh, we have uh, basically started. Uh, the many, there's going to be a program uh, to create to basically create future leadership uh, of Pakistan in AI, the 700 scholarships, uh, 300 PhD and 400 masters focusing on AI and IT. And HEC will be announcing these scholarships very soon. And similarly grants, investments, uh, where uh, we help uh, our people to basically, you know, where those who could. So now comes a very important question that, how can we innovate? Uh, I really like this one. It says, uh, it's Nokia CEO who said, we did not do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. And this is during a press conference to announce Microsoft acquisition of Nokia. Nokia CEO ended his speech saying this and the whole management team started crying. So innovation is fundamental. Uh, all the universities are ranked according to uh, how you know, innovative they are like Apple has been leading in 2020. Uh, so every country tries to be on top of the list because if you don't innovate, you don't exist in business. So it's important that we teach innovation to our students. So how can we teach innovation in our universities? It's, it's important. So, and uh, most of us who are teachers uh, attending this conference, they know OBE, but we really, don't understand the essence of OBE, which is outcome-based education. And OBE, we need to make sure uh, that once we are teaching, uh, we are focusing on higher level of cognition. And highest level is creating, where the students can create new product or a point of view. And similarly, uh, once we are giving them uh, projects, we need to make sure uh, that uh, we are again at the highest level of psychomotor domain. Uh, where they can create new patterns for specific solution and so is also in the effective domain. We need to teach them how to solve complex engineering and computer science problem. And what is a, a complex problem? It is being defined. It is a problem <coughs> which define, requires diverse resources, which requires an innovative solution. And uh, the, there has to be a problem where solution is not known to students. And this is very important for us teachers uh, to find out that how can uh, we develop uh, such a problem for our students to solve. It's a lot of work for the teachers to do. And for students, and how should you learn how to innovate? So this is that first thing, very important is that you have to find a problem that is to be solved. And the problem should be an important problem, a domain area. For example, once I was supervising a PhD thesis of Dr. Usman, who will be talking uh, today uh, in a session, uh, we went and visited a hospital. So it's very important that you go if you want to innovate, go yourself and find out pain of people that uh, where are the pain points. And then you try to devise uh, an innovative solution uh, to solve the pain points. So, we saw diabetic patients coming and they inject the needle and then they scan their eyes and then they uh, inject a dye into the blood and then they take further images. It's a very painful process for diabetic patients uh, uh, and for especially the old people. Uh, but then we decided to work on in this area and without injecting dye, if we can use AI and, and machine learning uh, to uh, uh, figure out whether there is some problem with the uh, with the fundus image or not, and 
many publications of Dr. Usman. Alhamdulillah, now he's even working for a U.S. organization, porting uh, these algorithms in their cameras and devices. So, so this is important that uh, you find an area, a pinpoint, and then you create a solution and a project, not in the air, and and then just creating a project out of your thesis and getting some funding and spinning a company. This is another master student and who came and in, uh, in the same visit and they took us to a room where they checked the um, squint in the eyes of a patient, the bang up in the eyes of a patient. They make him sit on a chair and they lit LEDs and they give, give him a pointer where he points to the LED. And if there is a squint, uh, we use uh, image processing techniques to find the extent of squint uh, and, and generating an automatic report. For, for the squint and the student got his paper, best paper award. And then we build a product and it is now in many installed in many hospitals. And then taking that product, the project, and then uh, finding funding for that. So we have four funding coming out of uh, undergraduate projects. This is a multi million matching. And we've been a company in USA on this. Uh, this is the telecardic and eye diagnostic system. We build uh, ECG machines. Intracardiac uh, diabetic retinopathy we a company uh, on this and OCT images. So, so for individuals, uh, students, uh, uh, you got to go and uh, find a user. As a company, what how you innovate is again innovation means uh, you are solving pain points. Uh, we developed the system for Sky Electric, a company which is selling uh, these systems, and now they have taken our development and have built onto this. But they are, uh, this is Ashar Aziz's company and he was very focused on innovation. Like he, he said pain points are, they are like load shading after every hour and we need to make sure we never get out, out of electricity. And then building the smart flow AI enabled system way, which ensures that you never get out of electricity uh, in hours of need and never buy expensive electricity, rather use your batteries. A very interesting projects. And for the case study part, I want to give my personal case study. Uh, as you know, I have this organization named uh, CARE, which is Center for uh, Advanced Research in Engineering. Um, so though I had this passion of arts and calligraphy, uh, poetry, I graduated, uh, uh, did my FSC from government college, went to NCA, studied there for one year then went to College of Aeronautical Engineering, did my aeronautical engineering, one sort of honor and many medals and could get into Georgia Tech. And that was uh, an institution that changed my total perspective on things. Got an opportunity to work on amazing projects. Uh, this was a project of uh, US Air Force where they were trying to um, control the surge and rotating stall of a jet engine. And you must have seen this modern jet engine can almost stand in the air. Uh, in, in this position and is because of these type of technologies they have developed. And then uh, I registered in the co-op program at Georgia Tech where they send you to work in industry uh, after every quarter. Uh, so I, I got taste of the industry in America working in universal RAND, scientific Atlanta building, uh, this radium system of satellite communication. Working for PictureTel was the first video conferencing company so developed um, a lot of technologies for them, and then wrote V.90 uh, modem software for Cisco system. So that was an amazing experience in America that made me believe that uh, we can do and develop these type of technologies in Pakistan as well. There is no reason that we cannot. And so I uh, came back with our friends in USA, started a startup in 1997 uh, and raised uh, uh, 17 uh, million dollars in venture funding, focusing on uh, voice over IP. Now, even uh, once I'm talking to you, it is voice over IP. So at that time, voice over IP, nobody uh, had, you know, even this term was not known to people, but people were expecting that there will be a humongous market for voice, for voice over IP and entire voice will move to voice over IP. So started focusing on that and then thinking of the products that we got to get into the core of the network and the access of the network and the subscriber end as well, developing our products and develop this chip, which 
at that time was the world highest media processor chip sitting in pakistan and and building exchanges like the amazing work uh, we did uh, way back then and our valuation at that time was about 500 million dollars this is a team um, we took our project to even general musharraf was the president of pakistan he was so glad to see such an innovation coming from pakistan and dr atau rahman inaugurated uh, our university but uh, so i also take pride in failing one of the most exciting startup in pakistan uh, when everything was right and 911 happened and 911 happened so once you have a startup it is like playing a ludo game you don't know even if you are at 99 you may be bit by a snake and you go back to square one and and this is where the patient comes into play so innovation and patient goes side by side um, so like ikbal says be khatar kut pada atish namrud mein is akal mein hai tamasha ila bobam bhi that you don't have to if you are not passionate uh, people will give up and we never gave up so we started another company and focusing on uh, solving our own problems and this is a very exciting uh, project that we did and in this project we were uh, competing with uh, raytheon america ctc china like big players and i was always thinking how can we beat uh, these big giants uh just sitting in pakistan so i came up with this idea that if we build a device uh, which has like seven nine communication technologies it will never fail so we started developing this crazy uh, very crazy uh, cognitive hub and this helped us to actually win um, a large business beating the very best in the world and now alhamdulillah we have this product uh, which is same guarding uh helping to safeguard our airspace uh it would never fail nobody can actually jam it because it has so many technologies integrated in it one goes away the other one comes into picture we got a us patent for this technology and again i take a lot of pride in once uh, we see on 23rd of march parade uh, the system uh, the system that we have developed goes on display uh so this is our team uh, about 250 plus people are developing amazing technologies showcasing it to the world and winning 12 asia pacific ict alliance award and focusing on the hardcore of computing embedded system e intelligence net centric systems erps resource planning systems all the auto loaders uh, in our tanks are fitted with the auto loader produce uh, in care uh developing the the telemetry systems a uh, software defined radio that we have developed very few country, countries in the world have this type of technology now working on 5g technology and doing innovation in 5g uh and bringing the 5g technology into an sdr uh then uh safeguarding our cyber space uh, at at the core of the cyber space and uh, developing these devices which can do network analysis um sentiment analysis opens and and this is the common the communication intelligence safeguarding what is happening in our microwave space uh and then helping our industry to transit towards 4.0 uh, we have this project we are we are developing uh, or doing this transformation for pac camera uh and doing this office automation system for pakistan navy and helping in the digital transformation so doing a lot of exciting work in care and then we have our own university uh, uh graduated about 70 phds 2000 masters and making sure that our students also learn the art of innovation and a good a very excellent example of an industry academia partnership i would always encourage every university Uh, to have an industry alarm uh, like i learned in america america the georgia tech has georgia tech research institute mit has an mit lincoln lab so and it should be independent from the university uh, so these are the things that we need to learn so to conclude uh, my talk uh innovation is becoming even more important uh, in post covid world because those businesses uh who you know innovated they are surviving others have wiped out uh and 
if we teach our kids to innovate as we rank like the lowest in the world uh, so i think uh, it is very critical for us for our academia uh, to teach our kids how to innovate if if we don't then it, it will be very hard for them uh, because i i know i have I've, i've been a teacher for 23 years uh copying is very easy okay you can always go copy something your assignments uh, even your projects your thesis uh, finding code from the internet uh but that you are not only damaging yourself but you are damaging the country that you deal with that so be very creative uh, if you cannot solve a problem it is okay but at least try Uh, do an attempt to solve uh, a complex problem uh, using whatever you have learned and you will learn more once you are solving that problem and especially to our teachers uh, almost time is up so in our universities we must create environment where students can learn innovation teaching at a higher level of cognition sirf ratta nahi lagwana bachcho se making sure uh that they know how to create new concepts is very important and we need to do the teachers training as well and and respects and and then trying to solve a local complex problem and finally uh, to our entrepreneurs those uh, who intend or who are starting a startup sometimes they are very bogus ideas you got to make sure that at least once you are starting a startup there has to be an innovative idea Uh, you can live being a student without innovation but you cannot live uh, without innovation as an entrepreneur so ecosystem needs to help even if we create few innovators uh, they can just change the destiny of pakistan so i conclude usually uh, with my own poetry which says saathiyo tod do shab ki deewar ko koi suraj kahin se nikal aayega kaam milke karo mehnaton se agar सब खजीना यहीं से निकल आएगा थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस आई वुड लव टू आंसर देम Thank you so much sir for volunteering your time to us. Shukriya ma'am. Thank you.
speed of the my connected memory my connected memory as well the I am profusely elated to take an opportunity and invite Vice Chancellor of Lahore Garrison University, Major General Shahzad Sikandar, Hilal Intiaz, Military Retired, for a welcome note. बंद कर ले पूरा खोल नीचे से पढ़ लेते हैं पूरे सेशन में सर इसकी ये सारी जो सेटिंग्स का नहीं होगा आपके ये फोन में ही अब इसको ऑफ कर लेंगे प्लीज जी ये ले ये फोन में क्या और अब आप ये यहाँ का क्यों आ रहा कैमरा क्यों नहीं आ रहा सोचा आ गया आ गया आ गया ठीक चले जी सर दोनों भाई बायोलॉजी फिजिक्स कोई कॉन्फ्रेंस में मसला नहीं हुआ कंप्यूटर साइंस की कॉन्फ्रेंस में कैसे मसला हो सकता है स्क्रीन शेयर आप करेंगे तो आज स्क्रीन शेयर करवाएंगे जी जी आ जाएं तो ये आपकी आ रही है अभी तो कोशिश कर
Sorry for the delay. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. It is with great pleasure that I welcome the participants of the fifth national conference of computer science and information technology 2021. I would like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Fawad Ahmad Chaudhry, Federal Minister for Information and Broadcasting, who despite his multifarious commitments, has consented to be the chief guest today. I am pleased to welcome participants from different friendly countries, including the US, South Korea, Malaysia and Saudi Arabia. Certainly, these types of conferences not only bring researchers from different countries to one platform, but also inculcate a research culture among the entire fraternity of education in the country, thereby contributing to the development of the nation. Am I audible? Yes, this conference on computer science and IT mainly focuses on exchange of information and feedback on developing trends in technologies. I'm glad that people are focusing on these areas and making nearly impossible things possible. Deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are already on the cusp of a revolution. Even though robotics research has been performed for many decades, robotics adoption has not flourished. However, the past few years have seen increased market availability of consumer reports, as well as more sophisticated military and industrial robots. Cybersecurity is becoming essential to everyday life and business, yet it is increasingly hard to manage. At the Lahore Garrison University, we encourage an environment of research and technical development. This is reinforced by providing financial and technical support and services through OREC and by conducting conferences for our young researchers. Along with the faculty, we encourage students to come forward and work on emerging areas of research worldwide. Our researchers have worked on many emerging technical fields like the Internet of Things, machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, software development, and many more. The conference aims to bring together leading scientists, researchers, and research scholars to exchange and share their experiences and research results about all aspects of computer science and information technology. It is envisaged that the intellectual discourse will result in future collaborations between universities, research institutions, and industry. Organizing a conference of this magnitude is no easy task, especially when we have participants from different backgrounds, areas, and educational institutions. I wish to compliment and appreciate the hard work of the Software Engineering Department of Lahore Garrison University responsible for organizing this conference. Although we had planned to hold this conference on campus, the current COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to hold it virtually. However, we shall have live presentations, discussions, and Q&A sessions. The conference will be broadcast live on the internet through Facebook and YouTube. Before we get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously helped us organize this event. Thank you 
and God bless all of you. Thank you for your kind words, sir. Now, our chief guest for today's session is a person who is a very renowned personality, a politician, and a current federal minister for information and broadcasting, Mr. Fawad Ahmed Chaudhary. He is a member of Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf's core committee since June 2019. He is a lawyer by profession and worked as a political analyst and an anchor for several media organizations. He launched Pakistan's first moon sighting website and issued five-year lunar calendar based on scientific readings. Please welcome Mr. Fawad Ahmed Chaudhary. Respected uh, Vice Chancellor, Major General Retired Shahzad Sikandar, Hilal -e Imtiaz, Deans, HODs, keynote speakers, presenters, and students. Ladies and gentlemen, at the outside, at the outset, let me express my sincere appreciation for the honor I have been given to officiate the opening ceremony of the 5th National Conference on Computer Science and Information Technologies at Lahore Garrison University. First of all, I am very happy that today this conference, which is the 5th time in Garrison University, I have the opportunity to talk to you and talk to you. मैं इस यूनिवर्सिटी में आ भी चुका हूँ गैरीजन यूनिवर्सिटी में बहुत ही खूबसूरत कैंपस है आपका बहुत ही जबरदस्त यहाँ पे फैकल्टी है और जो यहाँ पे हो रहा है काम वो यकीनन एक स्टेट ऑफ़ द आर्ट इदारे के तौर के ऊपर आप ये काम कर रहे हैं और आगे बढ़ रहे हैं और ये जो कॉन्फ्रेंस है जो कंप्यूटर साइंस और इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी के बारे में है और जो तमाम स्टूडेंट्स यहाँ पर हैं उनका भी जाहिर है कि ये एक मुद्दा है उनका एक इनिशिएटिव है कि वो कंप्यूटर साइंसेज में आगे जाना चाहते हैं तो so, सबसे पहले तो मैं जो स्टूडेंट्स हैं उनसे हमेशा ये बात कहता हूँ कि आप अपनी जो कैरियर है वो उस सब्जेक्ट में चुनिए जो आपको पसंद है क्योंकि आपने एक कैरियर के साथ एक तवील अरसा गुजारना होता है और अगर आपका दिल ना माने उस कैरियर को तो वो आप कभी भी ना उस कैरियर को इंजॉय कर पाएंगे ना ही आप उसमें एक्सेल कर पाएंगे क्योंकि जब तक आप कोई काम दिल से ना करें उसमें आगे जाना बड़ा एक मुश्किल काम हो जाता है सो सबसे पहले तो जो भी स्टूडेंट्स जो भी कैरियर अपनाना चाहें उनके लिए बहुत इम्पॉर्टेंट है कि उस शोबे को चुनें जिसमें उनका दिल भी है और दिमाग भी है कंप्यूटर साइंसेज और इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी जाहिर है कि अगर आप इसको देखें तो ये इतने नए सब्जेक्ट्स अब नहीं हैं और एक तवील अरसे के बाद ये ज़रूर है कि इस इन फनून में इन सब्जेक्ट्स में इतनी तरक्की हो गई है कि यूं लग रहा है कि जो तमाम मुस्तबिल है कायनत का तमाम मुस्तबिल जो दुनिया का है वो इन्हीं सब्जेक्ट्स के ऊपर खड़ा होगा और जो आगे कैरियर्स हैं 
ان میں ظاہر ہے کہ کمپیوٹر سائنسز جو ہے وہ کسی ایک سبجیکٹ کا نام تو نہیں ہے اس کے اندر اتنی زیادہ اسپیشلائزیشن ہے چاہے ڈیٹا کی اسپیشلائزیشن ہو چاہے ورچوئل ریئلٹی کی اسپیشلائزیشن ہو چاہے کوڈس کی اسپیشلائزیشن ہو اتنے زیادہ آگے اسپیشلائزیشن جو ہیں وہ ان میں آ گئی ہیں کہ لگتا یہی ہے کہ اگلی دنیا جو شیپ اپ ہو رہی ہے وہ سارے کی ساری انہی سبجیکٹس کے اوپر جو ہے وہ شیپ اپ ہوگی اس کے ساتھ ساتھ میں یہ سمجھتا ہوں کہ جو اس وقت جو جس قسم کا ہمارا ماحول جا رہا ہے جس قسم کی ہماری ٹیکنیکس جا رہی ہیں ان میں آگے بڑھ کر انفارمیشن ٹیکنالوجی کا کردار بھی بہت ہی اہم ہوگا ابھی بھی بہت اہم ہے آپ نے دیکھا ہے کہ ہمارے سامنے دنیا بدل گئی ہے آپ ہم سے ایک جنریشن پہلے کے جو لوگ ہیں اگر آپ ان سے پوچھیں گے تو وہ آپ کو بتائیں گے کہ کمیونیکیشن کتنا مشکل کام تھا کیسے لوگ جو ہیں وہ سفر کرتے تھے کیسے لوگ جو ہیں وہ اپنی منزل کو پہنچتے تھے فون کرنا ہی ایک کتنا مشکل کام تھا جو اب بالکل جو ہے وہ دنیا سمٹ گئی ہے اور یوں لگ رہا ہے کہ آگے جا کے دنیا کمیونیکیشن کی دنیا تو مزید سمٹے گی اور جو فزیکل فاصلے ہیں ان میں اور کمیاں جو ہیں وہ آئیں گی جو کمپیوٹر سائنس کے جو اسٹوڈنٹس ہیں جو انفارمیشن ٹیکنالوجی کے جو اسٹوڈنٹس ہیں میں ان سے یہ کہنا چاہوں گا کہ آپ جو بھی اپنے لیے شعبہ چنیں اس میں پھر یکتا ہنر تلاش کرنے کی کوشش کریں کیونکہ اگر آپ کے پاس دو آپشن ہیں یا تو آپ ایک ایسا شعبہ رہیں اور اس میں آرڈنری رہیں اور یا پھر ایک ایسا شعبہ چنیں جس میں آپ یکتا ہو سکیں ایکسل کر سکیں آگے جا سکیں پاکستان ہو یا دنیا کے باقی ممالک ہوں تمام ممالک میں علم کے اوپر ہی آگے جا سکتے ہیں علم ہی وہ واحد ذریعہ ہے جس کی جو جس کو بطور سیڑھی استعمال کر کے انڈیویجولس بھی اوپر بڑھتے ہیں قومیں بھی اوپر جاتی ہیں اور مجھے امید ہے کہ آپ کا یہ سفر جو اس زبردست ادارے میں جاری ہے ایک تو آئی وانٹ ٹو وش یو گڈ لک فار یور فیوچر اور دوسرا میں آپ سے یہ کہوں گا کہ اس سے مستفید ہوں بہت کم لوگوں کو اتنے اچھے اداروں کے اب موقع ملتا ہے بہت کم لوگوں کو یہ موقع ملتا ہے کہ وہ اتنی اچھی فیکیلٹی سے آگے بڑھ سکیں سو وش یو آل دا بیسٹ اینڈ ان شاء اللہ تعالیٰ آپ کو مستقبل ایک تابناک مستقبل ہوگا
Assalamu alaikum I am Amna Rashid from Software Engineering Department I being a student of Software Engineering clearly understand the importance of this field in Pakistan and potential we have if utilized properly we can bring prosperity in our country the following line accurately encapsulates the grand gateway the world is full of diamond and gem and we are having some of them here today to build this event we have very light panel who will be addressing the conference today I am feeling honored to invite our first speaker, Dr. Usman Akram. Dr. Muhammad Usman Akram is associate professor at National University of Sciences and Technology. His innovative product received appreciation at national and international level, and one of his product, HEWS screening system, used to diagnose level of squint and strabism in eye before surgery. Has already been placed at ten different hospitals in Pakistan, and more than five thousand patients have been tested on this device in the last few years. Join me in welcoming Dr. Usman Akram to address this conference. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Let's start. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. <clears throat> I, I will be sharing uh, our recent work in the field of ophthalmology uh, where we develop different solutions to help eye species in a uh, better diagnosis, especially in the area of ophthalmology and eye care. So uh, I, I will be uh, discussing few uh, about few diseases first, and then we will go towards the technical contribution which we have made in the field. Uh, most common ocular or retinal diseases include cataract, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, and there are other diseases as well. And out of uh, these major causes of blindness are retinal disease. In next couple of slides, I will share few short videos to give you all more insight related to these uh, diseases. So let's have a quick short videos and then we'll talk about these. Diabetic macular edema or DME develops as a complication of diabetes and is a leading cause of vision loss among working adults. Anyone with type 1 or type 2 diabetes is at risk. DME involves the retina, the tissue at the back of the eye that receives and processes what you see, and the macula, which is a small part of the retina, critical for seeing clearly. DME occurs when blood vessels leak fluid into the retina and macula, causing edema. In the healthy eye, a clear liquid called aqueous humor circulates inside the front portion of the eye. To maintain a constant healthy eye pressure, your eye continually produces a small amount of aqueous humor and an equal amount of this fluid flows out of the eye through a microscopic drain called the trabecular meshwork in the drainage angle. If you have glaucoma, the aqueous humor are you getting these slides or not yes sir your slides are visible but the video is stopped does not flow through the drainage angle properly fluid pressure in the eye increases and this extra force presses on the optic nerve in the back of the eye causing damage to the nerve fibers Age-related macular degeneration, AMD, is a disease that causes progressive damage to the macula, a central region of the retina. The retina is the light-receiving nerve layer located in the back of the eye. As the eye ages, debris from the RPE cell layer and surrounding tissues accumulates above and within the Bruch's membrane. The debris form deposits called drusen. The presence of drusen is usually the first sign of early dry AMD. 
Okay, uh, these are some of the most commonly uh, uh, ocular diseases which we have in Pakistan and across the globe. So uh, the reason behind uh, sharing these videos are that whenever we are uh, working in the area of biomedical, the first and foremost thing is that we have to know uh, the reasons and the things which are clinically been seen by the doctors. So if we want to help the doctors and the specialists in diagnosis uh, of some uh, diseases and to provide them different biomarkers, so we have to uh, dive into that medical domain first and then with the technical engineering knowledge, we try to develop algorithms which can do the same thing with uh, what the doctors are doing. So uh, to examine a human retina for diagnosis of these diseases, we have different imaging technologies available like fundus imaging, uh, uh, fundus fluorescein angiography and optical coronary tomography. Here, OCT and fundus are non-invasive ones where, uh, whereas uh, the FFA uh, dye has to be injected uh, before acquisition of multiple images of retina. So uh, while developing the uh, decision support systems for ophthalmology is the best, uh, imaging modalities are the fundus imaging and OCT, which can be used uh, without any intervention or uh, injecting anything in, inside the human body. So uh, we started working in this, uh, on these uh, uh, technologies. So before going further, I just want to highlight some of the facts and figures, like why these kind of diagnoses are important. So uh, just to give you an idea how bad ocular diseases are, we have around 285 million visually impaired people across the globe, including 19 million children, more, more, and more than 80% of these are uh, people with 50 plus year of age. And 90% of these are from low income countries like Pakistan and all these kind of countries, they are suffering from uh, all these disorders and they are, uh, they are quite large in the number. And if we specifically look at Pakistan, the condition is not good here. Like Pakistan has 1.8 million glaucoma patients and half of them are already blind. 480 people develop some kind of eye problem every day and 90% of these cases come from rural areas with no proper medical facilities and there is no proper medical equipment available uh, in the rural areas. So uh, what the government has done, like government of Pakistan has developed around 7,000 plus basic health units in rural areas to provide the basic health uh, facility to the people in rural areas. But these BHUs, they lack specialized equipment, especially when we talk about IK facility. So it's almost... Uh, kind of there, there is almost none available in this BHU. So uh, another issue is that uh, along with the equipment, we also need specialized doctors, uh, like in case of uh, eye, eye care uh, facility, we need ophthalmologists to analyze the reports and to analyze the data which, which are coming from the equipment. So in Pakistan, doctor to patient ratio is very low. Like we have one trained ophthalmologist against 0.1 million patients. Secondly, there is lack of standardized interfacing between uh, different imaging devices. FDA from USA, uh, for the first time of its history, they approved an AI-based system that is a retinal uh, computer-aided diagnostic system. Based on these motivation and uh, these facts and figures, we started working in the area of ophthalmology to address all these issues. And uh, over uh, the period of last few years, we come up with our research-based uh, product, which we call Albasar. Albasar is a standardized web-based electronic medical record system, uh, which uh, with the CN support system for diagnostic in ophthalmology, generally suited for any hospital, especially from rural areas connected to any metropolitan a hospital using telemedicine uh, system. So uh, this our solution at this consists of EMR electronic medical record system, which is a cloud-based system, and it also have a telemedicine module in it to connect uh, to the main hospital to the rural areas. And then we have retrovision, which is the main research backbone of this whole product, like where uh, all the engineering and technical stuff comes in and all kind of decision support system, they are part of this uh, module retrovision. And then uh, we also have health charting that, that, that is being used for stabismus. And we have placed this system uh, as already been uh, 
shared in the intro that it's uh, in 10 hospitals in Lahore and Rawalpindi right now. So uh, when talking about the retrovision, specifically uh, the research part of this product, uh, the main challenging task in this area is to handle multiple abnormalities appearing on fundus and OCT images. With thorough clinical insight, we understand all changes to differentiate between different abnormalities and how uh, they appear in different modalities, like how an abnormality is appearing on a fundus image or on, on an OCT image and what kind of changes are being there. So what we did, like we come up with a single framework covering a whole spectrum of disease uh, using fundus and OCT images. The framework includes uh, initial pre-processing module based on uh, image processing techniques, which highlights all clinically significant landmarks from the images, which are then passed to the uh, deep learning based modules. And here we have the deep learning based segmentation module to extract different clinical markers. And based on these analysis, retinal diagnosis is being done and its further grading is being done. All these modules have the capability to learn incrementally because it, as we go deep inside any kind of area, especially in ophthalmology. So there are a number of diseases which we have to cater for. So if the algorithms, they do not have that incremental learning scenario in them. So you have to retrain all the things from the scratch. So our framework for retinal image analysis, it has the capability to incrementally learn new diseases. And within the same framework, we keep on adding uh, the uh, other abnormalities which a doctor wants to see. Another thing which, uh, which is part of this uh, module is the uh, 3D reconstruction of retina. The same framework also includes 3D profiling reconstruction to give better visual insights to the ophthalmologist. This is important from clinical perspective, like as doctors are least bothered with the final diagnosis, what they want they are more interested to see the insights which lead to a specific kind of diagnosis. So until unless you are providing uh, the clinical biomarkers or clinical insights to the doctor along with the diagnosis. So uh, that, that is the thing which makes your product a success. And uh, that's the thing which like, uh, keep, uh, like in, uh, generate more interest from the doctors uh, to see, uh, to look into your product. So uh, while pre-processing as a pre-processing step, we introduced uh, structure tensor graph search based uh, techniques to highlight retinal features followed by a dynamic programming because we added a dynamic programming along with graph theory uh, for optimized execution of algorithms. So a, a GT a, a DP a, is helping us to extract different kind of layers uh, from uh, the retinal images. The graph search is implemented in multiple passes where it scans uh, for each retinal layers. It started with seed points and then eventually it converges to uh, a particular kind of layer. So when we talk about retinal images, we have around 10 to 12 different retinal layers which, which are of particular kind of importance for a specific disease. So it's important to highlight all kinds of uh, features in terms of layers which are available on retinal images. We further utilize the same graph search to deploy, uh, to handle different exceptions like outliers, uh, missing pixels between the closed layer, which are nearby to each other. And then also the backtracing along with interpolation to fill in the gaps and to complete uh, the layers so that there should not be any kind of uh, like uh, error uh, while creating those uh, layers. So uh, to, uh, to coming towards the deep learning. So after pre-processing we have uh, deep learning modules in order to cater all kinds of variations uh, related to retinal diseases. We have uh, designed our own retina analysis and grading network called RAGNET. Just like ImageNet, uh, which is trained on uh, daily life images, RAGNET has been trained for uh, 150,000 plus macular retinal scans to learn generic retinal features. So this learning has uh, made RAGNET capable of being used for any other retinal disease with just fine tuning. Along with this, the RAGNET has uh, the segmentation and classification units embedded in a single network to perform lesion influenced grading instead of simple image-based classification. So everything which we are doing is based on the features which are present on uh, the retinal images and those 
variations and features they are actually influencing the final decision rather than having simple uh, image based classification so we fine tuned dragnet for uh, optic nerve head analysis as well uh, which can now do analysis of optic nerve head disease like glaucoma or other glaucoma related uh, diseases uh, along with the macular analysis so this is the strength of dragnet like we have trained it on a uh, macular scan so they have uh, the dragnet have already run the retina features so now you just have to fine tune it for any kind of other abnormality without uh, doing the re uh, retraining from the scratch another thing which uh, we uh, wanted to do is like we want to have a single retina scan uh, a single uh, framework which can do maximum which can extract maximum kind of uh, findings from a single scan so as a single retina scan can have a number of findings and abnormalities so we designed incremental cross domain ad adoption model uh, to handle such large number of findings here, here is an overview of that uh, the first training stage as shown in a like the top block in which the classification network is incrementally trained on the first target domain to recognize k around k plus retinal pathologies from uh, oct scans the circles which are appearing uh, in each stage they are showing uh, the they are denoting uh, the different kind of categories which are being added in each step so apart from this uh, the bottom block b block uh, denotes the second training stage in which we incrementally adopt the network to recognize other m plus 2 retinal uh, pathologies from another imaging technique which is fundus imaging so here the proposed loss function like we want to ensure that the net, uh, network does not forget the thing which it he has uh, it has run run from the oct so what we propose that we propose a loss function that ensures uh, the network does not forget its prior learned knowledge especially its understanding from oct domain uh, so while learning the new retinal pathologies from the fundus uh, imaging we we have kept the learning from the oct as well so during the inference stage which is right on the right Uh, the proposed uh, incrementally trained cross domain classifiers can mass screen retina pathologies from both uh, fundus and oct imaging in simultaneously in respect of scanner specification because this is one of the issue uh, why we deal with a uh, different kind of uh, problems in images and uh, signals like uh, we have different kind of resolution for different vendors so it is it's important that your solution should handle Uh, the inputs from different kind of scanners which are uh, made from different vendors like topcon zeiss or hedelberg so all these deep learning modules they are being developed in such a way that they can learn the things uh, in, in uh, like quite quite robust manner way so that they can handle the inputs from different scanners and uh, as i have already mentioned uh, that our framework also give 3d visualization so using extracted layers we we generate 3d thickness surface between two layers uh, using all b scans of uh, with one uh, oct session and in order to give a proper visualization of thickness map the reflection models are computed and applied on a constructed uh, 3d surfaces so that now it has now a proper visualization for the doctors and uh, we further morph a fundus as a surface on top layer of uh, oct to give more insight uh, to the doctors so uh, in a nutshell the morphing help the doctor to have a one to one mapping of oct and fundus images while analyzing any patient data so now they do not have to see the oct and fundus separately uh, because both are morphed and linked together and registered together so one report is more than enough to give you detailed insight from both kind of imaging technologies and uh, apart uh, from benchmark data sets and other data sets which are publicly available or we were collecting the data sets we also have gone through clinical validations where all the algorithms are continuously being validated on real time clinical data and compared with different ophthalmologists like uh, in order to avoid the biasness we have at least uh, each scan is being validated from at least four ophthalmologists and the result shows very low false positive rates which actually shows uh, the confidence of uh, ophthalmologists on our system so uh, as a whole the results uh, also depicts the success of our uh, uh, 
success of our module for extraction of retinal information in respect of scan quality, scan acquisition machinery, or any pathology which is present in the scan. So based on all these uh, research or the things which we're doing, and we were promoting our research, our product Albasar. So we were approached by a ocular imaging re a research and reading center, California, which includes uh, ophthalmologists from Stanford. And they are also ophthalmologists from Pakistan. Uh, they're working in the Stanford and OIRC. They reached to us, uh, they want to uh, us to develop an AI-based ophthalmology grader for them. So uh, what uh, we are doing for them is that our solution consists of an expandable a cloud-based application that has integrated quality assessment module because quality assessment is one of the most important thing while uh, doing this kind of stuff because when, whenever you are doing the research in your labs or in your institutes so uh, you have very fine it, uh, images or you are very hand-picked images like uh, but once you are doing in the field so G google has, has found it very difficult like it was in news last year like when, once Google plays their system in Thailand, they face the difficulty of these analysis just because of the quality. So what OIRRC wants from us that our algorithm should also check the quality of uh, the input scans and based on the quality, it should recommend what kind of next steps uh, should be there. So after the quality assessment, we do detailed image analysis and our analysis actually finds 30 plus findings from a single scan. So this is the beauty of that incrementally learning framework, which we develop. Like now we have 30 plus finding from a single scan and this can be extended even further. And of course it's a cloud-based system. So it has also has a role-based access uh, to different uh, the users which are using the system. So this whole thing and uh, research work was uh, possible because of the collaboration which we have across the Pakistan, like we have, organization like NUST, Case Care, we, uh, we were uh, totally backed uh, with the Armed Forces Institute of Ophthalmology because without a, a clinical sport, uh, all this research was not, not possible. And with the help of AFI, we have also made uh, a number of data sets available online where uh, anyone uh, across the globe can use the data and uh, they can uh, do the research in this area. And we also have our uh, commercial partner, iStack, with us. And we are also thankful to Ignite and HEC kind of forums, which we have in Pakistan for to provide initial seed fundings, which made it possible to do the research. And then we can take that research to actually commercialize it. So in the end, I would like to say that 80% of blindness is avoidable. So our effort is to outreach people in our country, region, and across the globe to save some of this 80% from permanent blindness with the help of ICT engineering and technology. So with this, I thank you all. And uh, you are more than welcome to contact us uh, through any uh, these links. Thank you. So if you have any kind of comments or questions, uh, more than welcome. Thank you, Dr. Smanakam, for your thoughts and very fruitful talk, which has benefited all of us. Now, I would like to invite a second speaker, Dr. Aspandia Hilani. Dr. Aspandia Hilani has a PhD in computer science from City University, London. He has served at various academic and administrative positions in London, Madrid, Malaysia, UAE, and Pakistan. His Asia specialization includes blockchain technology, data science, and software product management. He's a member of IEEE, ACM, and British Computer Society. Let's welcome Dr. Skandiyar Gilani to share his research paper with us. Assalamu alaikum ji. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, am I audible? If, if anyone can just indicate. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just set up my screen here. And uh, there we go. All right, and I hope that you can see the slides as well, probably. Yes. Sir. All right, perfect. Just give me a second. 
All right. So first of all, thank you very much for taking out the time to attend the conference and to listen to my talk. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the management at Garrison University, in particular the CS department as well, for holding this conference despite all the uh, uh, difficulties and challenges of the pandemic. Uh, so I, I hope uh, you'll enjoy the talk uh, as much as I did while uh, preparing it. So. Today, I'll be talking a bit about uh, a certain aspect or feature of blockchain technology, which is certainly new. Uh, it is something that is up and coming, and it has its own overview. It has its own challenges and opportunities that we can uh, use in order to you know, uh, cater to a lot of use cases. So non-fungible tokens on the blockchain, uh, that's my topic for today. And I'll take you through the entire journey of what this is uh, and how it works. One pleasant problem that I have is that right after me, there's Dr. Sharyar, and I noticed that he has a similar talk to mine. So the good thing is that I can give, get away with the introduction and he can probably take on with the advanced stuff as well. So I think that would be a nice evolution of the talk. The best way to describe the problem uh, is to take the use case of art. Now, the problem with art is, or the good thing probably with art is, that it has some sort of value. And how is that value actually established? There are a couple of things that make an art piece valuable. A, uh, there is a verified proof of ownership at times, uh, as you can see. You know, there are certain museums and art galleries that provide certificates of authenticity and ownership that can prove that this piece of art is the original piece of art. Um, secondly, there's almost always a record of sale as well uh, at an auction or at an art gallery. So because it has a chain of ownership, it can be traced back to its origin at times. Uh, that's particularly um, true with physical art that we're talking about. The problem with digital art, and by art, I mean any sort of art. It could be uh, audio, it could be video, it could be digital art made uh, even on you know, uh, Photoshop or MS Paint or anything uh, that you might uh, use as a tool. Uh, or it could be some sort of audio clip. So art, by art, I don't really mean drawings. I mean drawings or any other multimedia, basically. So the problem with digital art is that uh, it can be posted on social media, it can be shared, it can be reshared, and it's very hard to sometimes verify the proof of ownership. Who actually owns this particular JPEG or who actually owns this particular audio? So, uh, and it doesn't really have a certificate of authentication, or there is no traceable ledger, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, one of the things that blockchain does is that it can sort of provide you with a copyright for a particular piece of art or a particular piece of audio, video, or game. So this is what NFTs do, basically. NFTs turn art, or multimedia into a digital form of uh, you know, media that has a certificate of ownership. Uh, it has some sort of provenance. What does provenance mean? That it can be traced back to a particular artist. So once a particular piece of art is transformed into an NFT, it has the following features. A, it can have a certificate of authenticity uh, in by means of a digital contract. Since something is already residing on the blockchain, it has some sort of traceability attached to it. So it can be traced back to the original uh, author of the, of the art. Secondly, it can be used as a kind of um, a limited series edition as well. For example, in the US, um, people collect lots of baseball cards. And uh, why do they collect them? Because they have limited edition uh, ma manufactured on it. And they have certain numbers that make them unique. So that can be used on the blockchain as well uh, to provide art as a part of a series uh, and make it limited edition uh, in essence. 
it can also be sold since it's on the blockchain it can be tradable so it can be sold on the blockchain it can be auctioned on the blockchain um, since the level of piracy would be some sort of uh, reduced to some extent there can be certain royalties that can be paid back to the artist as well uh, so so basically what it does is nfts provide almost the same uh, authenticity uh, features to digital art same as the ones that we saw for physical art so that's what nfts basically mean let's go a bit deeper into what an nft actually is non fungible token what does fungible mean fungibility is basically something that is replaceable fungible for example a 100 rupee note can be replaced by another 100 rupee note of the same value or 10 grams of gold can be replaced with 10 grams of gold of the similar value non fungible basically means that it's something irreplaceable for example a painting made by leonardo da vinci let's let's talk about mona lisa there is only one mona lisa you could photocopy it you could scan it you could make uh, you know fake versions of it but at the end of the day it's non fungible there is only one mona lisa so non fungible tokens are used anywhere where you need uniqueness in some sort of art form or some sort of media format so that's where the name non fungibility comes from non fungible tokens what is the technology that uh, uh, drives the nft market uh, it is basically based on the ethereum blockchain network um, ethereum is basically a platform which um, is a network of decentralized uh, ledgers uh, which provides Uh, the opportunity to create certain decentralized apps to update those apps to sort of uh, verify the authenticity of certain things on the ethereum network uh, ethereum itself is a separate talk uh, but you know this this nft thing is mostly based on that network so what it provides is that once The, the the artwork is placed on the uh, nft network or the ethereum network you get a unique id uh, which is uh, on a distributed database it has a public ledger so you can insert and select the data but since it's on a public ledger you can't really update or delete the data that's the beauty of blockchain so that you can uh, make sure that whatever is on there uh, has not been tampered with so that acts like a digital source of uh, or a digital signature of some sort how does ethereum basically work it's it's think of it like a linked list uh, of uh, blocks so each block basically has a hash of the previous block it has the time stamp on when that block was created and the actual transaction or which includes the payload the transaction id etc so it becomes a chain of um, uh, you know blocks that can provide some sort of traceability to that artwork so you could keep going back and you can see where the original artwork was actually minted on the ethereum network and each transaction also has the uh, the sort of like a price that how many ethereum tokens were used in order to buy that particular artwork so you can see the value of the artwork changing with that time as well the nft market is uh, really blooming and mushrooming uh, just yesterday visa the uh, uh, one of the leading financial companies in the world which man which you know provide our visa cards as well they invested in the nft market uh, which signals that it is being taken very seriously uh, by the major players uh there has been a 1785% increase in the market cap just this year uh, and the market has been going crazy since june um as far as collectibles is concerned so as i was mentioning earlier that you got series of things that can be produced and that are limited edition for example teenage mutant ninja turtles uh, does anybody you know sort of remember i i loved it when i was a kid there are only four ninja turtles leonardo donatello michelangelo raphael so if somebody wants to buy 
a particular uh, you know photo or an nft related to the ninja turtles there are only four available right so that's what uh, a, a series or limited edition series basically brings to the table uh, not really a protocol but the standard procedure in which the nfc nft works um, so the nft owner which is the creator first basically verifies that the title description and everything is accurate and uh, produces it or formats it in a way that is appropriate to the ethereum network the nft owner then stores that data onto a database and this consumes something called gas so with the ethereum network you've got certain tokens called gas which is basically um uh, it's 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 like a cost of doing a transaction on the ethereum network so when you're when you're minting something on a network you are spending something called gas uh, at the back end so that that transaction can go through uh, as i said ethereum is is a separate talk on its own sometimes uh the nft owner then uh signs the transaction uh, which includes as i uh, showed you previously the hash of the nft and the transaction then morphs into a smart contract so that's the beauty of the ethereum uh, network that it provides you with a platform to create a smart contract between uh, certain parties multiple parties uh after the smart contract has been uh, created the nft is actually minted on the network minting basically means like at the state bank of pakistan you mint notes or you mint coins so similarly you mint something on the ethereum network so that it's like burning something on the network uh once the transaction is confirmed uh the minting process is complete and then the nft is part of the blockchain and it has it will have a unique uh, sort of id uh, till its existence and it can easily be traded amongst people for a certain value um and it could you know sort of like provide you a copyright of that artwork if you own the nft token you own that artwork basically Uh, a bit about the workflow um so as i uh, explained earlier the nft uh, creator uh, basically creates the uh, so the the image for example on the user side it then uh, transforms into an nft which contains certain metadata the token id the date etc it then goes on to a smart contract uh, which you know then you have uh proof of work proof of proof and then you have some sort of proof on chain um the consensus is done on the blockchain network so that all the nodes know that this particular piece has just been minted on the network and then you know if there's a new buyer you can transfer the ownership of that of that particular token to the new buyer so that that artwork or piece of media can be transferred to the new buyer uh there are certain standards when we're talking about nfts or ethereum in general um there are three that stand out in this use case one is the erc20 standard this is the standard interface for ethereum tokens so if you're transferring ethereum uh, on the ethereum network any token or cryptocurrency that is built upon ethereum would probably use erc20 that's the standard so both the users the buyer and the seller would be on the same network uh, and using the same protocol in order to uh, interface for the for the tokens but for non fungible tokens nft you have another standard called 7 erc721 this is made specifically for non fungible tokens and is not really used in the context of erc20 where a normal transaction is taking place then you have another standard called erc1155 this is more for semi fungible tokens what's a semi fungible token think of it like a concert ticket or a ticket for a sports event where that particular ticket is spent once and then it cannot be spent again so it is unique uh, but it is semi fungible it doesn't live there forever it can't be traded forever so it has you know a shelf life uh, if i if i can explain that so erc1155 the beauty of that is that it's a multi token standard um, 
and it can manage multiple types of tokens at the same time. Uh, just a snippet of what uh, that basically means. ERC721, the normal um, uh, non-fungible token standard, as you can see, there's only one uh, sort of token that is being uh, transacted. But at ERC1155, you have this function called the balance of batch. This is, this is you, can, you can go to the, uh, so you can use the Solidity library or Solidity language in order to access these functions. So this balance of batch function basically uh, allows you to uh, query and uh, search for multiple uh, tokens at the same time as a batch, as the name suggests as well. The opportunities in the NFT market is are, are basically limitless. You've got the gaming industry. Uh, one of the keynote speakers in the beginning uh, spoke about the gaming industry, and you know this is one of the use cases over there as well. Uh, you've got digital collectibles, as I said earlier. I'll I'll show you a few in the next table as well. So anything digital which can have some sort of copyright attached to it can be used on the NFT network. Uh, so in 2021, this year alone, uh, lots of things have been happening on the market. Uh, as I said earlier, for example, basketball and baseball, uh, you know, related tokens and cards that are very collectible in the United States. That has been trending on the market and lots of them have been minted on the blockchain. Uh, similarly, other types of digital arts, digital cards, uh, trading card games, uh, you have virtual pets. So again, you can have a pet on the blockchain. People pay absurd amounts of money for these sort of things. Uh, the, this is one sort of use case. But for us, um, <clears throat> I would focus more on the copyright uh, sort of uh, use case of the NFT. Uh, there are certain galleries that you can open up after this talk. For example, one of the most famous, famous ones these days is OpenSea.io where you can see that uh, you can trade uh, NFT tokens and NFT uh, you know, images and art and videos. And you'll see that, uh, again, crazy amounts of money that you know, these things are being bought and sold for on the Ethereum network. There are certain challenges as there are with any certain technology, and this is relatively new. So there are four major challenges that uh, the NFT market is facing at the moment. One is the usability. So since it's on the Ethereum network, the network can be very congested at times. Uh, the network is just is not just catering to, to NFTs, it's catering to a lot of other transactions uh, for other cryptocurrency related things and other blockchain activities. So sometimes the network can be jammed and the confirmation process can be a little slow. Uh, based on the price of the Ethereum and based on the traffic on the network, there can be high gas fees as well. So gas, again, is a token that is used for, uh, you know, minting something and it's, it's like a cost of transaction on the network. So, so if the, the, the traffic on the network is high, the gas prices go up as well. It's, it's typical supply demand uh, uh, sort of uh, thing going on. Similarly, uh, governance, uh, people make money on those sort of things. What about taxes? Uh, in the United States, in the EU, these things of, uh, these sort of things are taken very seriously. And uh, you have to think about legal jurisdictions for uh, a lot of blockchain related activities uh, as far as Asia, for example, is concerned. Environment has been a huge debate over the last four or five months. Uh, for example, that mining a particular blockchain token takes a lot of energy and it's, this can hamper the, uh, the, the climate change sort of thing, revolution that's going on. So environment is another thing. Making it uh, less energy intensive is something that uh, researchers are working on. Similarly, extensibility and interoperability on different platforms. So as I talked about these ERC-20 and ERC other standard tokens, uh, there can be an issue of interoperability. So if one user is using ERC-20, the other, using is, uh, use, other user is using some other standard, 
you know, tokens can be lost in the network if both of them are not compatible. So these sort of things uh, need some uh, thought uh, by the researchers. And uh, this is something that's, that's uh, you know, uh, increasing uh, and gaining importance in the blockchain community. So thank you very much for your time and patience. I know the talk that follows my talk, Dr. Sharyar, has um, you know a similar sort of topic. So I think he'll be able to elaborate more on, on this. So thank you very much. And I wish you all the very best with the rest of the conference. And thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you, Dr. Spandia Gilani. Your presence has been very valuable for us. Now, I consider it a great honor to invite a third speaker, Dr. Shriyar Malik. Dr. Shriyar Malik is a researcher and consultant of computing and information technology with more than 18 years of teaching, research, consultancy, and academic management experience in the field of computer science and information technology in multicultural and international environments. He is currently working at Rifa International University. Lahore Campus is director of Rifa School of Computing and Innovation and Professor of Computer Science since 2020. Now let's welcome Dr. Shriyar Malik to share his experience with us. Shriyar Malik, alaikum. This is Dr. Shriyar Malik. Professor at Rufa School of Computing. We are going to discuss about non-fungible tokens. So we will see what they are and what are their applications and what are the research challenges associated with the non-fungible tokens. So if you talk about non-fungible token, the first and the most important concept is the fungibility. Um, what is uh, fungibility means? If we talk about something fungible, it means that there is something which can be exchanged or replaced with something uh, else at the same time. For example, you can exchange a currency note of uh, one type. Uh, let's say uh, you can uh, exchange a currency note of $100 with another $100 or two $50 notes. You can do that. Or, if we talk about two mobile phones, so they are interchangeable if they are of the same type. So this is called fungibility. What does uh, non-fungible means? It means that there is something which is really unique or one of a kind, and there are no two things like it. For example, a mobile phone is a different thing and a card is a different thing. So they are uh, two quite different things. And even if we uh, make uh, one mobile phone uh, really unique, so that becomes non-fungible. So the, this is the basic concept behind the fungibility of the non-fungible tokens. So now we talk about that, what is NFT or non-fungible token? So it's actually a unit of data which is stored on a blockchain, or uh, it represents some sort of a item which uh, should be unique. Uh, these items, uh, these unique items, they can be some uh, digital items or digital assets, or they can be some real world physical items as well. Uh, if we compare them with the uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum, so these NFTs, they are not mutually interchangeable, it means that they are non fungible, whereas the cryptocurrencies, they are also. Uh, fungible, uh, you can exchange uh, one cryptocurrency with another, or within a cryptocurrency, you can have exchange as well. Uh, for example, one Bitcoin uh, is not distinguishable from another Bitcoin. So both of them, they are Bitcoins. Uh, so you can really exchange them uh, with the same denomination. But uh, in contrast to cryptocurrency or even the fiat currency, the NFTs, they are unique. So it is one of a kind uh, piece of something that can be a code or any valuable thing or, or a painting or a digital asset or even a physical asset and its associated data, uh, which is generally being stored and protected on the blockchain. 
an NFT uh, can represent anything that exists or that can be represented by our digital stuff. Uh, because the NFT uh, does not only uh, can represent a digital thing, it can also represent any physical life uh, object. And that physical life object gets associated with some sort of a code, uh, which is actually being stored in the blockchain. Okay, so this NFT, uh, uh, it represents uh, some sort of an ownership and uh, this ownership uh, of uh, about a digital asset, it actually resides in a digital wallet. Uh, so we can create a digital wallet and we can have access to a digital wallet and then we can store our NFT or we can buy an NFT or we can sell an NFT through that. There are very few restrictions that what kind of contents can be tokenized and turned into an NFT. Virtually you can convert anything into an NFT uh, be it uh, some digital assets, some digital stuff, or real or physical life uh, object you can convert. NFTs, they provide you a way to uh, authenticate uh, ownership. Uh, and they, they tell you like who has created that, uh, that NFT. Uh, it also uh, provides you the permanency and uh, it tells you a blockchain recorded provenance, means that you can trace it back, you can uh, get to know who has created this NFT, who, uh, who bought this NFT, then who sold this NFT. So all this data is being recorded on the blockchain. Uh, you can have a distinction between the NFT and the copies of underlying digital asset. Uh, you can uh, even have more than one NFT representing different copies of an identical piece of digital art. Generally, most of the NFTs, they are uh, too much unique in the nature that only one of a kind or one copy of that type of asset has been created, but you can have multiple copies of an identical piece of art as well, or an you know, identical piece of it, some digital stuff as well. But the code which represents a specific copy is actually different uh, from the other copy. It's unique, that code is unique. So uh, with this method, actually, uh, these different uh, NFT-based items uh, or their copies, they uh, become uh, distinguishable from each other and they make them one of a kind uh, thing. What are the use cases of NFT? Uh, NFTs, they have a variety of application areas. For example, they can be used in the collectibles. They are being used in the gaming industry. They are widely being used in the gaming industry. Uh, right now, we see a lot of uh, you know, games which contains the assets, digital assets based on all the game assets, based on NFTs. You can buy them, you can sell them. Then in the arts, in the particular in the digital arts, like uh, you can have paintings, uh, you can have digital videos, which uh, are being created as NFT as well. Recently in Pakistan, Rasim Akram also sold his uh, collection of 1992 World Cup photographs as NFTs onto one of the very famous exchange in Binance. Uh, then you can have any sort of virtual assets being stored on to the NFT. You can also have real world assets as well. For example, you do have uh, you know, some property you can associate or you can create its NFT as well. Then you can have identity uh, stored as an NFT, for example, domain names you can store. Then you can have executable programs, applications can also be stored as an NFT or anything digital uh, that can really fit them into. Uh, the NFT case. And it's really growing day by day. We are having more and more application areas, more and more newer areas are coming. And where we are seeing that the NFT is getting more and more popular. The concept of NFT evolved um, from after 2012, 13, and it started booming after 2015. But in the past one to two years, there is a huge boom in the NFT industry and uh, the usage of NFTs. If you talk about the NFT properties, 
there are a few properties which uh, are really essential to the NFTs. Number one is NFTs are generally unique. That means they are generally one of a kind and uh, they are uh, distinguishable from the other NFTs. Then the next one is traceable. You can virtually trace all of its record. You can see that how many buyers, how many sellers have been there, what have been the uh, prices for each uh, so buy or sell uh, transaction, who created this NFT, who has remained the owner of this NFT and all these, uh, these things they can be traced over the blockchain. Then NFTs are applied uh, more onto the concepts, more onto the things which are generally rare. So because this rarity actually increases the uh, the cost that you can associate with the NFT. Because NFT uh, uh, requires some sort of a process which we call minting process, for which you actually create an NFT associated with an item. And that uh, costs you some bucks. It, it costs you some dollars and still uh, it is a lot. Then an NFT should be indivisible. You cannot divide an NFT. An NFT is going to be a whole unit. Uh, you cannot have, uh, let's say, if you are associating an NFT with a ticket, so you cannot have an NFT uh, which is uh, a half a ticket or something. So you need to have uh, you need to have a complete and an indivisible item. Then the programmability, this is quite digital, and you can program NFTs for buying, selling, and all this. You can do that. So how NFTs are created? NFTs are created through Ethereum blockchain. Ethereum has been a major uh, <clears throat> platform to which uh, you have been using NFTs. So Ethereum actually created the standard, uh, which is from ERC721, uh, which is for non-fungible token. And it has to add some information to the smart contracts, which are part of your blockchain. So it tells you title, description, etc. Detail about the NFT. So uh, once you create an NFT to Ethereum blockchain, it gives you a unique ID, and this ID is unique and traceable as well. And that uh, ID is actually associated with your NFT asset. And again, remember that that NFT asset can be a digital asset or it can be a real one or physical one asset as well. So it contains a unique ID, obviously, and that is only one in the world. And there should not be two IDs which are similar. So it also works like a digital certificate of authenticity. What are the benefits of having a unique ID for an NFT? Uh, number one, that you can have a verifiable proof of ownership, means that you can uh, uh, have a complete tracing, you can go back and you can trace back through that unique ID. The other one is that it, it creates a uniqueness and scarcity. Scarcity also increases the price and creates the demand as well, so it makes it more valuable. And they are linked to a cryptocurrency, so you can get a monetary value associated with, uh, with the uh, NFT. And these NFT, they can be sold or they can be auctioned or uh, an exchange or an NFT marketplace. And it, it can give you royalties back as well. It means, you know, for example, you have created an NFT, you, you sell it, so you have having created an NFT and for all these subsequent sales, you are going to uh, get some sort of a royalty for that NFT. And that can be anything digital. Well, generally, they, they can be uh, uh, what trans uh, uh, translated or transferred into a form of an NFT, or even it can be some uh, physical stuff as well. So how do you get the, that unique idea? actually get it through the blockchain. And what is blockchain? We, you know, I expect that everyone knows that because that is a prerequisite knowledge required for understanding of NFT. 
So in a blockchain, we do tons of transactions every day and every transaction has a unique ID. And that transaction is verified to be unique. And once verified, it becomes part of a public ledger. So that is called the blockchain ledger. So this uh, blockchain ledger looks like this, that it's, it's more like a spreadsheet. So uh, blockchain, how it is made, again, just one uh, small slide about it. That we do worldwide crypto transactions. They go into the blocks. And these blocks, they are interlinked. So a whole block checksum has been stored in another block as well. And we create a chain of these blocks. And then you can verify the uh, IDs of these blocks. You can check their IDs and you can verify. And there is a consensus mechanism as well. Uh, which tells that uh, some blog or some information is correct or not. A very important concept associated with this one is uh, that uh, download, if you're downloading, let's say, some sort of a digital arts, um, you have minted it in NFT, and you are downloading some image or in any format uh, or PDF or anything, it's not the same as downloading that. You know, if you are downloading a simple GIF or a wave or a PDF, it's not the same. With NFT means that not only you do have uh, these executable or JPEG or PDF or whatever format uh, your digital asset is, it's not only that, but it's also consists of the associated data with your, uh, with your NFT. And then uh, you can also have uh, your physical copy of it. So it's not only the actual JPEG or this thing, but it also consists of the associated data, which is actually being stored onto the NFT, uh, sorry, on the blockchain. And then you may have the physical copy. Uh, if we talk about the minting and NFT galleries, what is minting? Minting is actually the process of turning your artwork into an NFT. Let's say you have created a painting and you want to convert that uh, into an NFT. So you have to go through a minting process. So in that minting process, actually meta information about that NFT is being generated and uh, actually being stored onto the blockchain. What you can do is you can also store the data of that NFT, for example, that artwork as well onto the blockchain, but it is not necessary that, or not required that we store the actual artwork as well onto the, uh, that data store. Okay, you're getting the point, I hope that the NFT actually contains the data about that, uh, that asset, okay, which is being stored, which tells you the, uh, uh, creators info, selling info, and all these things, they are being actually installed. But uh, you can also store the actual uh, digital asset onto the blockchain. But that is obviously going to require more processing and uh, more cost as well for minting the NFT. So once you decide that you are going to mint an NFT, it's going to require you to have a digital wallet uh, available to you. So you can have an Ethereum wallet or uh, you can have other wallets as well, but only it's been minted through the NFT. Then uh, there exist many NFT galleries, uh, which helps you to mint the NFT uh, marketplaces, uh, NFT marketplaces. You can go there. You can associate your wallet with that gallery or with, the, with that marketplace, and you can actually mint that uh, uh, NFT, and you can even put it for sale or for auction onto that marketplace. So there are many, uh, one of them uh, very famous is OpenSea.io, and there are others as well, like superia.co, mintable.app, uh, foundation.app, uh, niftygateway.com, uh, cryptovoxel.com, and there are so many. Now coming to the NFT example, there are so many examples. Of, uh, so we are going to discuss here a few of them, but once the NFT uh, journey started, so in the early days in 2015, we come up with the concept of uh, Pact of Fraud. Hello, Pact of Fraud. And
So uh, it's based on uh, a very popular uh, main character, Factor Four. So they created these uh, NFTs on the uh, for sale. Another uh, very famous is CryptoPunks. They become very famous. So they were created in uh, 2017. And what they were, they were really small time, 24 by 24 pixel characters. And they live on the Ethereum blockchain, but they were unique. So what they did was they created 10,000 characters, about 6,000 something were male characters and 3,000 something were female characters. And uh, initially they allowed anyone to claim the punks for free. So the people they claim them, and then later on, they, they uh, put them on uh, sale. And uh, one of the very expensive one, uh, Ape Punk with a TV, it was sold for 150 Ethereum. You can imagine the price. So uh, for the crypto pranks, average price per transaction started virtually from zero. And then in October 20, you can see here that uh, average price uh, per transaction for selling one crypto punk was around. Uh, more than 5,000 US dollars. Another example is CryptoKitties. They were also created in 2017 and it was a virtual game which allows uh, its player to uh, create or uh, breed, raise uh, their uh, cats, uh, their kitties, and uh, they can raise them and then also they can trade them as well uh, with the virtual cats. Are. One crypto kitty uh, actually even got sold for 600 Ethereum as well, uh, which was at that time around 172,000 US dollars. There are many other examples as well, like NBA Top Shot by uh, Labs, uh, then My Crypto Heroes, Crypto Voxel, Decentraland, Lina, Crystars, Beeple. Beeple's uh, uh, art was sold for about 33,300 So at that time it was around $69 million. So you can imagine it is the uh, most expensive ever sale in the history of NFT, in which the people art was sold for $69 million at that time. Then there are other, some other as well, Gavin Shapiro, Philip Podaz, Rafael Grassetti. Uh, if you talk about the NFT market distribution in the year 2020, the sales, they were uh, large, mainly in the domains of metaverses, in art, in gaming, and then some in the sports as well, in collectibles and then utilities. And if you talk about the number of sales, the maximum number of sales, about 37%, they were in the area of gaming. And then 27% were in collectibles, and the rest they were in the other way. Future consideration of the discussions that they are there are like there are some ethical legal implications, like if you take someone else's work and call it with yours and then monetizing from it. So, or what you can do. Then, similarly, if you're taking someone else's work A and work B and putting it together and calling it yours, is it really yours? And the people, they are doing that. And then, environmental climate implications are there because NFTs minting. It requires a lot of processing power, and therefore you need to have a lot of energy consumption, so which creates a greenhouse effect. Uh, so uh, it's associated with a gas consumption. So the cost is there, and then uh, environmental effect is there. If you talk about the challenges, there are many challenges. The first one we talk about is the usability challenge. In the usability challenge. Uh, the first one is slow confirmation. NFTs usually send the transactions to smart contracts to achieve reliable and transparent value. But uh, currently, the NFT systems are really quite closely coupled with the underlying uh, blockchain platform, uh, so which actually affects their performance. Another very really important issue is actually the high gas prices. And um, the after uh, after some time, because uh, once your blockchain is growing and growing, so the minting the NFT is becoming expensive. Then security and privacy issues as well. 
Uh, one uh, issue can be the anonymity or privacy issue. Yes, there is anonymity or the pseudo anonymity, but it's not fully anonymous in the end of the day. So you can have the privacy issue there. Then the other issue can be, and it's a big issue, NFT data and accessibility. Because generally, uh, in many digital assets, they only store the metadata of that NFT or the core NFT on the blockchain. Whereas the actual digital asset reside outside of the NFT, like on an IPFS uh, system or something. But uh, what about if that IPFS system or any storage system, it becomes inaccessible? So that can be a challenge. Then there are governance related issues as well. And um, there are uh, legal pitfalls as well, where uh, there are legal and policy issues regarding NFT. For example, if you talk about the cross border transactions, know your customer data. So these are the issues related to the uh, NFTs. Then comes the uh, taxable property issue as well, like if you are having IP related products. Uh, some books or something, and you're selling them. So how the tax is going to be collected because most of the transactions you have made on to, uh, almost every transaction actually, uh, actually been made through the cryptocurrencies. And it's not legalized in every country or not in a legal uh, tax framework in every country. So this is a kind of issue. Then comes the extensibility related issues like NFT interoperability. Uh, right now, the existing NFT uh, ecosystems are isolated from it. So if you want to select one type of product uh, that can only be exchanged or buy on that ecosystem, you cannot have an interchangeable uh, option with other ecosystems. So that is also a challenge. And the last one is the updatable NFTs. Uh, Generally, on the transitional blockchain, they update their protocol to the software's minor modifications which they do. And then the hardware folks as well, in which they do some uh, significant modification. But NFTs uh, are having issues with these folks and with these updates. So that is a big challenge. So this is all for my presentation. Thank you very much for joining and listening to me. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shreya Malik, for sharing your novel work with us. Now I would like to invite a fourth speaker, Dr. Allah Ditta. Dr. Allah Ditta received his MSc and PhD degrees in Computer Science and Technology from the Kaiser Azam University, Islamabad, Pakistan, and the College of Computer Science, Beijing University of Technology, China in 2012 and 2017, respectively. In 2017, he joined the Division of Science and Technology and breaking as an assistant professor at the University of Education in Lahore, Pakistan. His research interests include information security, digital stenography, cryptography, network security protocols, and wireless sensing network and machine learning. Now let's welcome Dr. Aladita to share his experience with us. Thank you so very much. Uh, can you listen to me, please? My voice is clear. I'm audible. Yes, sir, you're audible. Thank you. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. Here is Dr. Edi. Thank you so very much for your nice introduction. So the topic of my talk is uh, predicting the length of stay of indoor patients by using machine learning techniques. 
and I divide my talk into four sections. Uh, that will be start from the introduction towards the research problem and so on. So let's start from the introduction. Like any organizations, success is based on the updated information for its smooth functioning in the same way hospital administration's at most desire is to have updated data about the admitted patients and their length of stay in the hospital. So we can define length of stay, we call LOS, as a time between hospital admission and discharge measuring days is an aspect of care that can be costly for most healthcare system if not approached properly. Patient length of stay is a critical indicator of efficiency of hospital management. As you people observed and have experienced multiple times that in practical life, that most of time hospital management does not exactly know when the existing patient leaves the hospital. This information could be crucial for hospital management as it would allow them to uh, take more patients for admission. Hospitals have limited resources, as you know, requiring efficient use of beds and clinician time. With the uh, recent pandemic situation of COVID-19, this notion has been ex exemplified. So patient length of stay is critical indicator of the efficiency of hospital management uh, in this pandemic situation. Now more than ever, we can see that it is in the most interest of patients, best interest of patients, hospitals and public health to limit hospital stays to no longer than necessary and to have an idea of how long a given inpatient may need to stay Therefore, it is very important to design such models that uh, could help hospital administration to predict the LOS of the patient. The significance of uh, this study is the ability to predict how long a patient will stay only with information available as soon as they enter the hospital and are diagnosed can therefore have many positive effects for hospital and its efficiency. There should be a significant model that can predict the patient length of stay, could allow hospitals to better analyze the factors that influence the length of stay the most. Such analysis could have uh, the path for reduction in the length of inpatient stay which could in turn have the effect of decreased risk of infection and medication side effects, improvement in the quality of treatment and increased hospital profit with more efficient bed management. Furthermore, uh, predicting uh, patient length of stay also greatly benefits the patients and the patient's families as well. They can have an idea of how long they can expect to stay upon being admitted. Predicting LOS allow a hospital to scale its capacity during its long-term strategic planning. The problem of statement is to predict the length of stay for patients who got admitted in the hospital based on level of severity of illness and vital states. Objective of uh, this research is to find the hidden patterns, explore the data of the patients, how to find main factors that cause a long stay of patients in the hospital. And to keep these points in mind, we create a robust model that can predict the length of stay for patients upon admission to the hospital and to manage the available resources efficiently and to decide when will the hospital be ready to take more patients? 
if we focus on our literature the machine learning has been widely used to predict the future based on the best behavior of the data in the past there is variety of models of machine learning which have been used to predict the los of the patient including the unsupervised and supervised machine learning models a comparative analysis of existing technique here you can see from this table uh, different researchers achieve different accuracy by using different models and uh, by these approaches every researcher try to follow the best methodology to predict the los but some limitation exist in their research study most of studies are limited to a small data set of patients they took very small data set of the patients and they took a specific disease only one or two diseases and apply the models on that diseases to find the los for the general recommendations to the hospital administration we have selected a large data set and uh, more than 2.3 million patients it include a range of disease including heart transplant lung transplant respiratory system diagnosis bipolar and so on the main objective of this study is to apply different supervised machine learning models to the data set and to identify a robust model to make future prediction of the hospital los of different disease patients when it comes to the process flow our process start from the data collection of a raw data followed by exploratory data analysis eda data pre processing correlation formulating and perform the training and testing on the data then build a model which one is where uh, uh, is best one from the selected model evaluation of the model performance and variable importance about data collection and description to, to conduct this analysis we use the public available data set that taken from the health data government a website managed by the usa department of health and human services which maintain updated health and social care data in the united state the data set contains detailed information of more than 2.3 million patients with 34 variables as you can see in the uh, this table including cost charges gender age race ethnicity and many more exploratory data analysis eda was used to analyze the data set and summarize the main variables of the data set as part of eda we first inspect the schema to study the data type five number summary is generated which includes count maximum minimum standard deviation by analyzing this we can easily identify the range of values that each numeric variable contain as we can see in figure a the description plot of the los is displayed in the form of normalized histogram the plot shows that the distribution of los is not symmetric most of the patients stayed almost 0 to 5 days in the hospital whereas a very less number of patients stayed longer than this period in case of categorical variables we used bar graphs to check the relationship between independent and output variables that is los in figure you can see here from b to f bar graphs of some variables such as all patients refined severity of illness apr risk of mor mortality clinical classification software diagnosis description type of admission that have shown at most variance in output variable have been displayed it is very important for data analysis that the used data should be correct and complete because uh, 
there are a lot of missing values in the data that negatively affect the performance of the model. For this purpose, data set used for this study was checked and missing values were identified. It was noticed that among all variables listed in the previous table, here you can see 10 variables had missing values and three out of these 10 variables, payment topology two, payment topology three and birth weight had a higher count of missing values than the rest one and hence were removed from the data set. However, the remaining seven variables from one to seven serial number, if you see from one to seven, hospital service area, hospital county, operating certificate number, and so on, had a relatively low count of missing values. Therefore, we kept these variables but corresponding rows information was removed for further analysis. Correlation is an important statistical concept that is used to find the relationship between variables. It has a range of values between negative one and positive one, where negative one indicates a negative correlation and uh, Positive one indicates a positive correlation, while uh, zero means there is no correlation between the variables. As you can see here in this table, table shows the correlation between independent variables and LOS. As you can see from the table, facility name, authenticity, CS, CCS, diagnosis, code, zip code, and many more have a negative correlation with LOS, while discharge year and abortion edit indicator have zero correlation with LOS. While all remaining variables have a positive correlation with LOS, such as total cost, CCS diagnosis code, and total charge have their highest correlation with LOS. After the selection of important variables, of the data set and the data set was divided into 80-20 ratio, 80% for the training and 20% for testing. The trained data with a similar proportion was separated for training and validation portion. And all these necessary processing has been done here. In machine learning, there is variety of models, as you people know. Machine learning, which have been used to predict the LOS of the patients include unsupervised and supervised models. In this study, the data set is taken, as I described before, from the medical hospital as an output in the form of continuous numerical values. Therefore, supervised machine learning regression algorithm were used to make prediction of the patient's LOS. The chosen regression algorithm in this study are multiple linear regression, lasso regression, ridge regression, decision tree regression, extreme gradient boosted regression, and random forest regression with significant output such as R square, and mean square error. The nature of this study is comparative where six different models have been used to predict the LOS in the end model with the highest accuracy score will be chosen as a robust model to predict the future LOS. For parameter tuning, cross validation is a very useful technique used in machine learning modeling, and most of the time it performs better than the normal validation set approach. It divides the data into K folds, for example, 10 folds. Every time nine out of 10 folds go for training and remaining one for testing. This process is uh, repeated 10 times so that all the folds go for training as well as for testing in the end average test accuracy is obtained. Okay. 
as you can, can see from this diagram. After fitting the models, our next step is to measure the performance of the models. Two important performance measuring techniques such as mean square error and R square score are used to measure the above mentioned model's performance. The main idea is to uh, train and uh, uh, validate model first by using 10 folds CV for parameter tuning and uh, then testing the model and on 20% of test data to see the model performance on the test prediction. As we can see from the table, RFR random forest regression model showed MSC of five and R square score of 0.92 for the test data. These results indicate the superior predictive performance of the RFR method as compared to other models. By comparing the R square and uh, MSC values, we can see, we can conclude that the RFR model produced the best results. RFR was the model in which explanatory variables were able to explain the variation in output variables, that is LOS, with the highest R square score of 92% and the lowest MSC score of five among all six models. XGBR ensemble algorithm is the second best model in this analysis with R square 90.8% and MSC score of 5.62 and remaining MLR, LR, RR were not able to fit uh, uh, this hospital data properly and perform poorly on the data. Variables importance is an important technique that is used to identify which feature among all features are relevant in making prediction. Features prediction score were calculated using the random forest model. Variables importance tells which feature are primarily contributing to fitting the data are explaining the variation of the output variable, that's why. It can be seen in graph that total cost CCS diagnosis and total charges are the most important variables in terms of the importance score. These results are consistent with the finding of exploratory data analysis where LOS was found to have high correlation score with these variables. Apart from these three variables, plot also reveals the part played by other variables, although secondary, in predicting the LOS. In this study, the main objective is to build a robust model that could predict the hospital LOS of the patients coming to the hospital in future. Predicting hospital length of stay will help the hospital to make an estimate of resources available for the patients and to manage the available resources efficiently. Best model was RFR model with minimum MSE and maximum R square scores. And the RFR model has the ability to profoundly improve hospital management and patients' well being. The prediction model would become more accurate, lower MSC, and higher R square with this optimization. And uh, we also, in future, have planned to increase the number of variables and build more accurate model. And also we have tried to build a model to predict the total cost. That's all from my side. Thank you so very much.
Thank you, Dr. Latita. You are very privileged to have you with us today. I consider it a great honor to invite a fifth speaker, Dr. Khaled Khan. Dr. Khaled did his PhD in computer science from Kite. Karachi. Later on, he did his postdoctorate in blockchain in blockchain from UTP Malaysia in 2019. Currently, he is appointed as director of College of Computing and Information Sciences in Karachi Institute of Economics and Technology. His research interests are in blockchain scalability and trust mechanism, desktop grid, and decentralized clouds, and IoT-based healthcare. Join me in welcoming Dr. Khaled to address this conference. Assalamualaikum, ji. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, obviously. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone here, and thank you for having me on board. Uh, my discussion today uh, would be more a generalized discussion on how uh, we can reduce the spread of pandemic through the available technologies. And recently, we have seen a disruption of various technologies that uh, promises to bring lots of change. So how we utilize those technologies? Uh, to lower the spread of pandemic and how we can use it uh, to continue working in the in the era of pandemic so that the economy of the country remains at par. So these two are the objectives of my generalized discussion. And uh, I would like to share my screen with you. Okay. Is it visible? Yes. So this is me, uh, a brief introduction. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm responsible for the computer science related program, CS Data Science AI at Karachi Institute of Economics and Technology here in Karachi. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we are running one, one of the uh, the biggest program in the city. Uh, we are hosting more than 3,000 students in computer science. And uh, uh, the research area of KEET is also improving a lot. So as a start, I've been given 20 minutes. I'll try to conclude it in the available time. So uh, the basic definition, pandemic is an eruption, of course, of a disease that comes forth across the world and then it spreads uh, across the geographical location and ended up in a uh, huge number of fatalities. So this is not the first time the human race is facing a pandemic. We had uh, influenza in the 20th century and as the COVID-19 is spread across, we all have searched it because it was the talk of the town that what happened in 1918 and all that. Uh, but in our lifetime, we all who are around 40 uh, have, uh, have, if not seen, have listened about SARS and swine and then uh, Ebola and everything. So this has actually happened in our lifetime. But the, uh, these were not declared uh, as such pandemics. It was more an epidemic because it didn't cross, these didn't cross many geographical boundaries and the fatalities wasn't that big as well. Initially, when COVID-19 reached to us, initially it was also considered an epidemic rather than a pandemic because uh, if you remember, it was the, the one city of China yeah, everyone was talking about and we have seen those videos where the people were, uh, were falling uh, even during walk and uh, then it obviously outbreaks. So these are the stats um, that I took earlier this month. So it now has a reach to two and three countries and more than 20 billion confirmed cases and the fatalities has reached beyond, way beyond 4 million. So uh, WHO has declared it as pandemic in 11 March 20 and I remember uh, uh, the key decided to close the shutters on 19th of March. And since then we all are actually uh, doing things from home. So the huge rays of fatalities, you can see 2.06 million infected cases and it's increasing. But uh, 
coming to the point yes uh, this is not the first time human race is experiencing pandemic but now this is the first time when we have enough technologies through which we can do things uh, through which we can a- a- at least try uh, to lower the spread if not we can uh, if not to actually correct it but at least we can lower the spread so these are the two boxes one represents the communication part and one represents the computing and the intelligence part so iot is there we all have experiences we all are experiencing it uh, and once those senses are around us and then obviously we need we wanted that immediately we wanted and it's the most logical step that these senses should be communicating among each other and to their managers and to other devices and the, without human intervention uh, those machine to machine technologies uh, actually it's an umbrella term and you can have ai data science and uh, various other communication mechanisms involved in that but with the advent of dlt and that have also happened in around 2008 but if you search the literature you will see that last 5 6 years have actually about 80% of the literature for the dlt uh, if you are not aware of the dlt distributed ledger technology then you must be aware of the bitcoin and the blockchain so dlt is a kind of blockchain technology and bitcoin is the implementation of blockchain so what these technologies uh, promises so iot of course promises you that you will get into everywhere from everywhere and those would be very energy saving sort of a small devices tiny mini they generate micro data and loads of data and then you need a fog layer to send it to the cloud and you can do decision making there uh machine learning again you 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 will be having ai and ds and you'll be doing computations and dlt through which um, those untrusted devices would be able to generate trust and they'll be able to reach to an agreement with, among themselves and on the basis of uh, some uh, on certain uh, algorithms uh, on the basis of that we will be this, the machine would decide what to do and what not to do whether to get into an agreement with a specific machine or not so these are the communication part where now the trust is also there and there is no point now that the machines cannot be able to generate trust and communicate this is the computing part the other part is the newest blue tooth beacon and it is obviously being compared with the ultra wideband the thing uh, blue tooth beacon promises is basically the low low cost energy saving small devices and initially the the throughput wasn't that big but they were able to pro, uh, cover 70 meter across uh, ultra wideband promises more uh but uh, obviously the the technology behind is different they are using signals two different types of signals through which they calculate the proximity of the devices both the technologies do what they will be once the devices are using these uh, technologies they will be able to uh, understand the position of each other so basically is a positioning enabling system uh, with uh, gps is for the larger scale so for a small proximity these are things doing things good but the recent 5.1 uh, addition of the bluetooth beacon is promising more better results than ultra wideband lt is there obviously when we talk about 4g lt was lt was the leader of the show and gave amazing results already implemented trusted technology why i'm not talking about 5g because uh, it's not actually uh, it's there and nobody can refuse that but lt is also there and if you read all these stats across the globe you'll see that all of the people experts are saying it's there because if ig is uh, is not about implementing it in isolation and 4g and 5g would be uh, joining hands so once we have the computing part communication part intelligence part trust part with that and we have the means to communicate in a low promising uh, low promising area means in a short distance and we have lte as well so once we 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 do that once we saw it in a holistic manner so the sensors can communicate with other sensors other devices uh, through the short term communication ranges and once the devices on the move the lte can help and the trust can be enabled with the dlt and machine learning and ai can help to establish good decision making so this is an overall knowledge cloud that can be built once we are able to uh, do what once we are able to amalgamate all these technologies 
So, my, as I've told you that one part of this, uh, the proposal is related to what we, what I'm presenting is related to, uh, to help the organizations so that they can keep their work going. And uh, obviously the organizations are now industry 4.0 enabled. So we have all the industrial IoT things are there, the safety, quality, and network centric applications all are there. So once the technology is almost all, already there and if not there, the technology is uh, not that expensive anymore and it can be quickly accepted uh, once uh, once uh, it is it is ensured to the entrepreneurs that the, the business would run they would they would definitely be opting it if it isn't there as well so the organizations are ready uh, but the way out still is the forced lockdowns and forced lockdowns uh, with these technologies uh, would obviously be keeping the the companies and the organizations and manufacturers away from their from their work, and obviously uh, that would uh, be hitting and actually hitting our economy as well. So once we have these technologies available, so we will be able to uh, come up uh, with, a, with with a framework with a method methodology through which uh, we can enable things. So what we are actually doing, we are saying that by using all these technologies, we are able to do social distancing or contact tracing. We'll be able to do isolation management and we'll be able to do geofencing as well. So one by one, I'll be able to explain you that. All we need is a wearable device, of course, and a wearable wristband is there already. So our small tweaks uh, and we can enable that. Uh, what we envision is a wearable band which has a Bluetooth beacon technology for contact tracing. And once that wearable connectivity is there, so Android iOS application would be maintained. And once, uh, if the device is not in the close proximity, then LTE would take a charge from the Bluetooth beacon. So Bluetooth beacon is for the close distance and LTE is for the long distance. How are we going to do it? So first of all, it is related to the social distancing. So what we are doing, uh, that we'll be able to uh, implement LoRaWAN routers. LoRaWAN is uh, the state of the art technology for, for all this internet of things uh, enabled environment. And once it is there, so what we'll be doing, we'll be enabling our wearable devices so that they can uh, implement LoRaWAN protocol. And that's how the protocol would work. So blockchain would be enabled to, to uh, so that those devices can, uh, can trust each other in passing the messages and transmitting the data. And the scenario would look like that if I come to in a distance of less than two meters, say, so the alarm would be generated, both the parties would be informed that something is there in the close proximity. So that's how we'll be able to do what? We'll be able to have social distancing available. Uh, the, the next thing obviously would be related to uh, isolation management. Yes, so once we, the wearable device is with us and it has all uh, both the versions and the data transmission available. So by using the Bluetooth beacon, we have the GPS coordinates and um, with that and allowing GSM and GSR or LTE technologies, we'll be able to establish a self-conceived notion for the isolation. So a person who has it wearable, uh, if that thing is kept from his mind that he needs to have an isolation available, but if someone coming close, so it would be again informed and the person would be able to uh, re reallocate himself or herself uh, to position where, which is considered safe as per the WHO best practices for the COVID. Last but not the least, uh, yes, uh, this is the pictorial uh, for the same thing that we have the BLE band available and that BLE band can directly be communicating with the cloud using LTE or it can be communicating with other BLE uh, gadgets, other variables, so, and it can communicate with the app as well. So all three options are available. Uh, then it's all about uh, the fencing. So we, uh, for fencing, obviously we need to fix the coordinates. Um, this is only not applicable to, to COVID patients. So we know that they shouldn't be going out unless uh, if someone is put to isolation 
Uh, how would you ensure we have seen cases where the people have actually uh, run away from the isolation centers? So you can apply that in the quarantine centers and hospitals, and you fix a, a virtual setup, a virtual boundary, it may be circular, orthogonal, or whatever. And you have formulas to calculate uh, the radius. And then uh, those residents uh, should be able to communicate uh, with the smartphones of, and detect the violation of the boundaries. And once the person is getting out, um, the alarm can be generated. So in this way, we, we can uh, address all three areas. We just said that, and in which we have covered proximity and we have covered isolation, and all three areas. So um, the analysis says, and we have some uh, basic results available with us. So obviously we can say that lower tally of positive cases, of course, once you are able, and we, once you are continuously told, it's like the beep of the seatbelt alarm. You know, If you are not in a habit of putting the seatbelt, although it's good for you, but still if you're not then, and the alarm would pushes you to have it. Uh, it helps to play a wider role, maintaining distance, and yes. Uh, we have done that. Um, contact tracing is important because uh, it is not only about preventing uh, the pandemic, uh, but it would also boost the economy. Why it boosts the economy? Because that's how we'll be able to keep the work going and the organization can be can trust these mechanisms uh, that they can keep their work going and still they will not be contributing to the increase in the pandemic. And uh, a few conclusions about the technology things. Uh, industrial implementation, ID devices is already functioning, right? We, we, we need to have it at our place with our own uh, methods and going. And uh, Bluetooth Beacon, obviously 5.1 is promising a lot. And uh, it's, it's good, it's really good. And uh, uh, it, uh, with the LTE, it can really help in both the ways. So um, I think uh, I am able to complete my talk in the allocated time. And uh, the future direction would be obviously to apply various big data and AI uh, algorithms to get the results in the right area um, and get more maturity in the results. And we can obviously use the smart cameras to, to have a second layer of contact tracing and personal positioning uh, to, to improve the results. Uh, thank you very much, people. Uh, after a very technical talk, uh, I'm sure this talk is well placed with a generalized discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khalek, for a very good contribution. Your knowledge will prove to be very fruitful for our listeners. Now, I would like to wind the session with, with this beautiful quote. The science of today is the technology of tomorrow. Now we will be back after break. The next session will start at 2.20. Thank you.